Squirrel. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, Spencer. We're swapped Hello. around again. Huh? We're swapped around again. Yep, but I know you do it on purpose. Oh, missing house. There he is. Back in time. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, I can't see the comments yet. Oh, we got, well, we got, we got a few people in here already. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, mods, for being in here and taking care of everything. It was my call to go live, Pyro. <laughs> but let me tell you let me tell you why we have to go live it's because we got da roberts on here and greg and him started talking backstage and i'm over here like going hey time out you got to say all this over again <laughs> so you know what everybody knows who da roberts is he's backstage we're just gonna bring him out right is that cool with everybody here hey, we yo. go I love your intro. That intro was freaking cool. I love it. That is Chris Reinhardt made that. Misty hates him. I love him. I he do makes not, and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he knows better. Chris hey, Reinhardt of, made that you for know in a couple of days. Yep. Just so everybody knows, by the way. Yep. Me, uh, Sherry, and a couple of the girls. So y'all make sure you catch it. Uh, he's supposed to have me on here for Pretty quick. I, I finally broke he's, down. He knows I don't hate him. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us. We're going to jump right in it before they start swapping stories again. <laughs> we don't have it recorded. So, DA, starting from the beginning, pretty please. All we got to do is go back 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> now, before you became known for what you're known for now, you were in law enforcement, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Would you please just run down the whole thing again, and we'll just go from there, how you started out in law enforcement? Well, I'm, I'm a hillbilly from the, from the sticks of Missouri. Um, most of my family has been in one uniform or another, cops and military. Uh, I did did a hitch in the army, uh, you know, did almost 20 years in law enforcement before a, a back injury forced me out. So, uh, you know, I've spent most of my adult life in one uniform or another. Uh, and But I've always had an interest in this field since I was a little kid. Growing up on a farm, you'd hear weird noises at night. And, uh, you know, and, things, and of course, you know, that was back you know, in the 70s when the Patterson-Gimlin footage was big and, and it really sparked my interest. So I've always really kind of had an interest in Bigfoot since I was a little kid. Uh, but as as I grew and, and and talked to more folks, that interest not only grew, but I met other people who were involved and who had hex, had experiences, and it really kind of changed how I looked at things. But when you're when you're an active cop and a cop, and I'm sure Greg can back me up on this, that's not something you want to toss in an official report uh, because you you were liable to find yourself you know suddenly facing a flurry of random whiz quizzes. And, uh, you know, then, then somebody's going to send you for a psyche valve because you don't you don't necessarily start talking a lot about Bigfoot, especially if you don't want to be taken apart on a witness stand. If a defense attorney go, oh, you're into Bigfoot. Well, then they, they will attack your credibility right there on, on the witness stand. How can you honestly say my client did this when you, when you believe in Bigfoot? Well, how can right. you not believe in Bigfoot? So we, I kept that kind of that, that aspect of my of my life kind of quiet. Uh, while I was still active, but now that I'm retired, man, it's uh, the sky's the limit. But you know, I had a, had a lot of crazy stuff happen in the woods as a kid. Uh, but we had we had some weird stuff happen while I was a cop too. And the the cool thing about when you become that in in that network of uh, of other cops, you 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 really you become part of an extended family. You can go to another agency and never have met these guys, 
before in your life. And in 10 minutes, you're sitting, sitting drinking coffee like you've known each other your whole life. It happens. It happens at every agency I've ever trained with, every place I've ever gone to. And, you know, sometimes you can kind of feel folks out. You can say, hey, you know, you ever had anything weird happen to you in the woods, that kind of stuff. I didn't bring it up with everybody, but there were times I would have guys that would just say, well, yeah, what do you mean? And then we'd kind of sit off the side and, or sometimes meet up after the training and, and, and talk about it then. But I've collected a number of really creepy stories from other officers around the Ozarks and had some weird stuff happen, happen to myself. Um, you know, we, uh, I, when I worked out at Walnut Grove as an overnight patrol officer, we would get these routine calls from people that live right at the edge of town. This is a rural community. It is not a big city. It's about 650 people. And uh, we would get calls from people that live right at the edge of town, which is surrounded by woods. Uh, we, we'd get calls by people calling, uh, uh, saying they had prowlers. And, you know, you know, working as a as a patrol deputy before, or working as a as a uh, as a deputy sheriff, and as a corrections officer too, you know, you would you when you get a call, you go and investigate these things, and that's what we would do. And initially, way we'd go, and we'd not find anything on these prowler calls, and it wasn't just me that was getting these calls. Um, so I, then I started talking to the people that were reporting the the prowlers, quote unquote prowlers, and they would never describe who or what they saw, but they would say things like. You know, I was sitting in my living room and something hit the side of the house. And at that point, we started really thinking this isn't kids. This isn't just neighborhood kids that are messing with folks. Because some of these people were getting the side of their house hit hard enough. It was knocking pictures off. Now, you know, I've seen some pretty good hay buck and wood hauling 16-year-old kids. But I ain't never seen one that could walk up and slap the side of a house and knock a picture off inside. That'd be, right. a, that'd be a big old kid. And uh, frankly, I knew everybody in that little town and, you know, there, there wasn't anybody, you know, nine feet tall and 400 pounds that was going to be pulling that off. So we started paying a little more attention. I talked to my, my chief about it and he said, well, maybe it's bears. And I'm thinking, I don't think that's bears. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's not typical because we have black bears here. We don't get grizzlies or anything. A big, a really big bear around here, 300, 400 pounds. That would take a lot for a bear that size to hit a wall you know, eight, nine feet up and knock pictures off. Um, that, that's not that's not black bear behavior. But, man, again, my chief was, you know, not wanting to, you know, say what we were all kind of thinking. Then guys started catching glimpses of things, like in their headlights as they were patrolling the edge of town. Uh, they said, that, you know, like something dark ducking into the trees and things like that. And I said, do you think it was a bear? And they'd always get the same look and they'd go, Maybe. <laughs> so, but I couldn't ever get anybody to go on the record and say what they thought it was. Um, I started patrolling the edge of the uh, edge of town pretty serious, and I had a number of times where I saw something dark ducking back into the trees when I'd play my my uh, searchlight across these properties. I'd go out to to look at the prowler call and I'd shine the tree line and I'd catch a, catch a glimpse of movement, but I never actually got a, a clear enough physical image where I could say. This was a this was a big footer. This was a bear, uh, and you never got anything on the dash cam. Uh, but uh, you know, it, I know from growing up in the woods, there's there's not a black bear in the state of Missouri on its hind legs with its head higher than the roof of my patrol car running into the woods. So I, I had a pretty damn good idea what it was, and there toward the end, even the chief did as well. When you showed up at some of those locations, if, if the people called in and said, hey, there's something, you know, prowl or something slapping on the side of my house. Whenever you guys showed up, I assume it's, you know, not that long afterwards. Right. It's minutes. a small town. I mean, you know, it would take us, you know, just a couple minutes to respond anywhere in town. It's not a big town. So when you showed up or any of the guys that you know of, when they showed up, was there anything still actively happening at the place? Did anybody did anybody find anything suspicious? I mean, you know, you would you would think that if you if there was mud on the ground, you found an eighteen inch track or something. Everybody's going to be like, "Look at that!" Not saying what it is, but I never had anybody point out a track, no, either officer or reporting party. Uh, but I did have a number of a number of guys I knew say, "Man." It was like a like a freaking skunk in the area or something. It's really it's felt terrible when I got there. 
Um, I didn't smell anything on the times I would get out and check, but I've had a number of times I've got out of the car and immediately put my hand on, put my hand on my service pistol because you, you get out of a vehicle near the woods and it is absolutely dead quiet. That, that's a, that's kind of a, kind of a butt pucker and moment. You're like, yes, sir. Dang it. this is, this is not normal for this to be quiet. It'd be this quiet and be like, you know what? On second thought, I think I'm grabbing the shotgun tonight. You now I'm going to leave, leave the pistol in the holster. It's and, a shotgun uh, night. Yeah, it's definitely a shotgun night. But uh, and, I, and a lot of these old, these folks that had, had would call in these 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 prowler accounts, they just didn't want to say it. They you know I knew they were holding something back. They you know didn't want to sound crazy. That you know, they, and, and unfortunately, that is the way things are with most people. They don't want to say, "Well, I saw a Bigfoot," uh, because right. you know. There's such a stigma against people coming forward and reporting this, but I knew they they were shook up, and more shook up than they would have been if it'd been you know four or five sixteen year old kids out there throwing beer cans at their house, you know some of them old farmers which have just stepped out and cracked out a twelve gauge round and been done with it. Um, some of these folks were pretty scared. I I was getting ready to comment the same thing that you just said. You would think in a backwoods community, you know, there'd be a lot of people throw open the door and fire a shot into the air or something. So you're saying that a lot of the incidents that you're talking about, the people called and said, Hey, there's something going on around my house. And whenever you get there, eerily quiet, dead quiet, and still and everything. And the people you felt like they were holding back. So nobody ever said, yeah, Somebody came up and slapped the side of my house. I ran outside with a shotgun and we saw them run away. I mean, I mean, there had to be some legitimate, you know, uh, whatever perverts running around or just creepers running around. I mean, there had to be some legitimate, but a lot of times you would get there and there's just nothing and the people don't even want to really describe it. Well, it's one of those little towns where, you know, you, you laugh, but it's pretty true. Uh, when the sun goes down, the sidewalks roll up. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. you, you work overnight shift out there. After 9 p.m. when the convenience store closed, that's it. I mean, <laughs> you pretty much don't see another soul till the end of your shift. Do you recall any of the uh, people talking about something being on the roof, throwing something on the roof? Do you recall any of the people saying that they went outside to check and got the creepy vibes or or smelled you know smelled the really bad smells anything like that did anybody ever elaborate not that, not that was reported to me and a lot of the other overnight guys that worked in worked in town didn't really put any of that kind of stuff in the reports we did i couldn't get anybody else there at the department to talk about it however uh there were quite a few small animals that would go missing on the regular uh, and people mm. would say, you know, I, I know that things coming, whatever it is, is coming around the house because my dogs will, will go get under the bed. Uh, and, you know, if that's teenagers or just some local hillbilly wandering around your yard, dog's going to be at the door barking like crazy. Right. Uh, but, you know, it, to me, it was just always indicative that there was something out there. Uh, and, you know, that that area is pretty woolly. I mean, you know, the, the Ozarks have got some pretty thick woods in them. And uh, that that area is... Well, it's right up. It's on the right on the Greene County, Polk County line, and a lot of sightings in Polk County. House. <laughs> now you're a part. <laughs> well, what I was, what I was, we were talking about backstage when Spencer said, "Whoa, stop! We, we got to go live." What I was telling them a minute ago was just north of our our county seat in the county I live in. And we've got this massive forest here about middle ways between it and one of the largest cities in my county. The sheriff's department was getting toned out or getting sent out on a call. And there was just a, a like three or four houses in a short stretch. And this is pretty desolate. I mean, it, it's pretty isolated. There's, there's not many houses, but we kept getting calls on, there was just these three or four houses that were somebody was messing around at night. It would always be late at night and somebody was like, it would be something hard hit the wall. Somebody was throwing stuff up on top of the roofs 
and these houses were getting, they thought basically the same thing DA was talking about kids or somebody just being a, a butthole, whatever, harassing these people. Well, it, it was, it got to where it was pretty regular. I mean, it would be like sometimes once a week, sometimes more, sometimes it'd be several weeks, but it kept going on. But the one house that kept getting or kept calling in the most, it was two adult women and they had a couple of, of daughters or, or young girls, but everybody in the house, it was all females. And that was the house that was getting targeted the most. And I, I know that that could still be somebody, a, a, a person that's going, hey, this is just women. We can harass them and it's probably less dangerous. But kind of like what DA is talking about, where I live, it's really isolated, really desolate, low population. And people around here will shoot you. I mean, women or not, you're running the risk of somebody blowing your head off because you're snooping around at night. Yeah. But the deputies was going out, you know, everybody's going out there showing up. Couldn't find anything, this and that. But they were finding rocks, big as my fist, on these people's roof. And this rocked on for a while. Well, I got talking to Kunbo about it. And this was, this has been, it was probably a couple of years before Kunbo's best buddy, Bubba Gump, that he grew up around, uh, known researcher with Kunbo. I got to talking to, to Bubba Gump on the phone. Well, Bubba Gump's grandparents lived in the county I lived in. And Bubba Gump gets to tell me about some of his relatives. He was kin to a lot of people that, that I knew. And he told me about where his grandparents lived. And see, Bubba Gump said, you know, they had had encounters like him growing up as a child at his grandparents. His grandparents had had encounters with boogers. Well, he goes to telling me about where it's at. And I go to putting it together. And I'm like, look, Dave, where your grandparents' house was, where this is happening, these calls, is like within a quarter of a mile. I mean, his grandparents lived on the opposite side of the road. Just down the road was their old home place from where all this stuff was happening with these people. So that pretty much really put it in my head that, yes, this is probably boogers. But that was where Bubba Gump's, I mean, just on the other side of the highway, down the road, just a little ways. And that, that's where this was happening at. But it's just like what DA was talking about. The stuff, you know, beating on the houses and stuff, which, I mean, everybody that listens to us knows that I have that here. And uh, we'll, we'll tell them in a little bit what I had. What's it been, eight days ago, nine? I don't think it was even that long. Well, it was uh, one weekend. I reckon it was then. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so, DA, whenever you're in a an official position of the mm – -hmm a law enforcement officer, like you were saying, you know, your word has got to be solid for whenever it's adjudicated and everything. Right. <clears throat> While you were looking at all of this stuff and the ideas were rolling around in your head that, you know, maybe some of it might be attributed to boogers or, or something not normal. There's probably not a lot of people you could talk to about it without you know, getting too far into the water and having to worry about them saying, hey, he's done throwing them right. off. But Yeah, you, you kind of had to test the waters. You know, you kind of had to be careful about it. Uh, but over the years, I've talked to judges, lawyers, doctors, and a lot of other cops that have had weird experiences out in the woods. Well, so if you had it on your head that this might be boogers, at what point did you go, or did you ever, I should say, did you actually start walking in the woods or going to certain areas and looking for these things, looking to see if you could see sign of them, you know, anything well, like that? Did you do well, the whole? A lot of that land out there is private farmland. Uh, and you know, I, I didn't didn't want to go traipsing around without permission, but there are some areas around it, some wildlife areas around there uh, that I have been to and looked around. And, you know, you can go into an area and you just kind of, you just kind of know that area is right. It's got the habitat. It's got water. It's got game. It's got good places for shelter. This place, this area out there meets all of that. There's plenty of water. There's, there's plenty of game, plenty of cover. Um, so, you know, th this thing, this thing, these places hit the right check marks. I mean, you, you, I, I've been to lots of places where you get out in the woods and I'm like, man, I can barely see a squirrel in here. I don't think I'm going to find yes. anything bigger. Uh, 
but th those areas out there wasn't uncommon to see deer in town. I mean, so th there's plenty of game out there. There's there's plenty of water sources, spring-fed ponds. So that area is good habitat. But finding good places near Walnut Grove to get into, little tough. Uh, but there are some wildlife management areas out there. Uh, there's one up by uh, Andy Dalton Shooting Range uh, where I parked. I would park at night and just roll my window down and listen. And I've heard wood knocks, I've heard vocalizations, but they're always distant, they're always out in the woods. Uh, but uh, now, now that I'm starting to get around a little bit better after the back injury, I'm, I'm planning some, uh, some local deep woods expeditions with some good folks that I, that I trust. Cool. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got a good group of folks that we, uh, we can go out. And of course, we've all, we'll always bring our good friends, Smith and Wesson. <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I keep say, I keep saying wildlife management areas, man. Uh, that, wildlife management areas, for some reason, they seem to be even better areas than like these giant state or 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 national parks and everything. I'm t the wildlife management areas. I don't, I don't know what it is. I find a lot of stuff up here in wildlife management areas. Uh, My oldest son. And one of his friends like to take their telescopes out way away from town because Springfield has a lot of light pollution. Uh, they like to go out to some of these wildlife wildlife areas and, and look at stars and, you know, they look for UFO, UFOs. He's, 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 him and his buddy are into that. Um, but he went out to an area not far from Walnut Grove out to one of those wildlife management areas. And I didn't know he was out there. He went out there with his buddy. He's grown. He's 28. Uh, but the next day he comes over. He's like, Dad, I want to ask you something. I'm like, what? He's like, I was I was out in such and such wildlife management area, and we were just in the parking area, and uh, we had all the lights off. We were looking through the telescope and, and and using our cameras and looking at the stars and stuff. He said, I kept hearing something. I said, What it sound like? He said, Sound like somebody beating two big sticks together. I'm like, Oh yeah. He said, I heard it on one side, and then I heard it on another, and then oh. I heard it behind us, and oh. then I heard it across the road. Uh -huh. And every time I heard it, it was a little closer. I said, what'd you do? He says, well, when it's, when it got close enough where I thought I felt like they were like within a hundred yards of the parking lot, we just loaded up and left. I don't blame them. I'm glad that they did. Hey, hold on one sec, DA. Uh, North, Northwoods Cryptid Investigations. We would very much like to hear about that. Uh, the email address is woodwalkers511 at gmail.com. We'll put it up at the end of the show. If you get a chance, would love for you to write us and we'll figure out a way to talk to you and everything. Yeah. like to hear about that. Sorry, DA, didn't mean to interrupt. No problem, no problem at all. Uh, you were saying backstage that also, you know, you had heard some other really interesting things from some of your cop buddies and other people and everything can is is that stuff you can talk about publicly can you like as long as i don't say their names or the okay. or the department they're with uh, i talked to a guy at a training at a training seminar down by table rock lake um, real nice guy he works in one of the counties near on the other side of table rock lake near the arkansas border um, and he, him and I were talking and I asked him, I just, I, I, you know, he's just another hillbilly like me, grew up in the woods. And I just straight out asked him, I'm like, you got anything weird happened to you out in the woods? And he kind of looked around and wanted to make sure nobody was close. He goes, I'll tell you this story. He said, but I want you to never tell anybody my name. He said, because I'm not planning on retiring. He was younger than me. He said, I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. And I don't want this to come back and bite me in the ass. I said, all right. So he proceeds to tell me the story. He says, there's a plot of land near Blue Eye, Missouri that I have been hunting since I was 10 years old. I'm like, okay. He said, every year I would go out there deer hunting. I had a regular area. We had food plots put out there. He said, this was my spot where I, where I always went. He says, the land belonged to a friend of mine. He was too old to hunt. And he always let me hunt out there and there wasn't anybody else out there. He said, one night I got out there pretty early. I got up in my deer stand. He said, I had one of those soft-sided coolers with me with my lunch in it, with you know, like he carried a lunch with a with a nylon strap on it. He yeah. said, I get up, he get up in my, my deer stand. He says, I'm probably 10, 15 feet off the ground. 
He said, I'm, you know, I'm a little, little sleepy, and it's kind of, quite a bit till, until sunlight comes, until daylight. He said, so I wrapped that strap around my leg just in case I dozed off. And he said, sure enough, I did. He said, I come to, and I felt something tugging on that strap. He said, I opened my eyes and looked, and this thing's head was level with my knee. I said, what did it look like? He said, it was, he, he said, well, it was dark. So he, this thing just looked like it was black. He said, and he says the eyes, he described the eyes as being like, like a horse's eyes. He said, the eyes didn't have a whole lot of white to them. He said, but it was looking right at him and it was tugging on that lunchbox. I said, what'd you do? He said, I didn't want that strap and he let it have that damn lunchbox. He <laughs> said, he said, I wasn't fighting that thing for a couple of bologna sandwiches. I can tell you that. And I said, well, then what happened? He said, it just walked off with the lunchbox. He, I said, did you stick around? He said, hell no. I waited until I was sure I couldn't hear that thing moving anymore. I climbed down out of my deer stand and I went, got to my truck and I left. He says, and I, I'm a lifelong deer hunter. He said, I put my crap up for sale the next day. I'm not going back out there. He said, if you want that deer stand, I'll tell you how to get it, but I'm not going to get it. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's Look, squirrel, squirrel's got her microphone muted. Misty, weigh in here. I, I have to. My neighbors have got their radio going and it's loud, so I didn't want to interrupt. Is it is it the music from no. the road or beside? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm not even gonna say what what <laughs> genre of music are they enjoying? No, no, <laughs> no. Come on, Sparker. <laughs> That's a valid question. There Mr. goes the algorithms again. No, I've got some weird neighbors, and <laughs> they give me a lot of crap. That's what they're telling their people right now. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in college, I had an apartment here in town, uh, right over next to the right, with just a couple blocks from the college, and I had all morning classes because I worked it in the evenings, and the guys that lived in the apartment right up next to my my apartment uh, would always go out and party because they had eve afternoon classes and they would come back from the bars and just have have music all kinds of music like you know heavy metal black hey, rap music whatever whatever they had a party going on they just had this music blasted and i would the first couple of times i'm like guys i got class in a couple hours can you keep it down they're like yeah you're sure no problem they turn it down and 15 minutes later it's blasting again so then I started calling the cops and, you know, same thing had happened. Cops show up, knock on the door, tell them to, tell them to turn it down. And, uh, you know, they, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, it'd be right back up again. I'm like, all right, fine. And at the time I had one of those big component stereos with speakers that are about four feet tall. I'm like, all right, two can play at this game. So I went to the library and I checked out some CDs. And um, when next morning when I'm getting ready to go to class, I turned those big speakers up against their bedroom window set the volume to maximum and i put the bilston glenn bag bagpipe band on loop and left <laughs> i came back 12 hours later they were sitting outside on the on, on the on the uh, sidewalk waiting for me like dude we will never have our music up loud again please turn that shit off <laughs> <laughs> that's priceless <laughs> oh god blast them with bagpipes <laughs> hey, hey da if you've never watched our show, and for anybody that's new, you got to go back and find out. I don't even know which episode it is. But Greg talking about being out with one of his cop buddies and the chick with the with the ears for beers. That's all I'm going to say. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, a lot of people do, but ears for beers. Greg, anyway, what was the, just real quick, what was one of the funniest things you you were ever involved with being a cop? Oh, me or Greg? I thought you were asking Greg. You, okay. you DA. Um, when I was working in the jail, uh, I was a, I was the property officer for one rotation. And whenever the officers would arrest somebody and bring them in, we'd always have to strip search them and everything because they were being processed in. And, um, so when they bring, Springfield police brings this guy in and I pat search this guy and I catch a rather sizable bag of marijuana that they missed. And at the time, marijuana was still illegal in Missouri. It's legal now. But, you know, he had a, a significant quantity that they had missed on their pat search. So I showed him I'm like, hey, I found this. You guys missed it. 
So they, they took it and started adding it to the report. They're like, hey, if he's got that, he may have more. Can you take him and strip search him before we leave? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I take this guy over and I toss him in one of the showers and shut the door and go back in and open the little pass-through window. And I'm like, all right, I need you to remove your clothing one article at a time. And you know, I'm like checking seams and everything. And when we get to the get to the point where where uh, you know I've got him down down to nothing but his, but his birthday suit, I tell him turn around, bend at the bend, bend to the ankles and squat and cough. And he just kind of half bends and goes. Ugh. I'm like, oh no, 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 we got something. Drop all the way down and cough. <laughs> well, when he does a about a about a quarter of a pound in a in a, in a, a plastic bag of methamphetamine just right out of it and um i go and when i found it in his pants he goes these aren't my pants these pants belong to somebody else these aren't mine and so when when the meth pops out i go let me guess somebody else's ass and i thought my sergeant was gonna die he was he was laughing he's like oh my god you can't say that on camera i'm like too late (laughs) it's already out but the guy looks back at me and goes would you buy would you buy that i'm like not even a little bit (laughs) <laughs> what uh, what other Bigfoot show are you going to get stuff like people shitting methamphetamines out? Uh, you're not going to. <laughs> hey, Scar, thanks for the story, D. No problem. Uh, hey, D, uh, I guarantee you, D.A. will back me up on this. Most people out here, the civilians, have no idea of the correl- correlation between massive drug u- users and having some kink and having all kind of toys that's like everywhere. It's not wrong. Everywhere. I mean, vehicles in their house. If they've got a shed outside, there's gonna be some some stuff laying out there. Oh, that's yeah. like, what <laughs> is this? It's crazy. Uh, uh, say it with, <laughs> I w- say it I with the pat- algorithm. I was pat searching a guy. <laughs> I was pat searching the guy one night and he's acting real squirrely. And uh, I, so I quit yeah. taking stuff out of his pockets. And, and once I even took his belt and everything, he's still acting weird. I'm like, you got something else, don't you? And he's got his hands up against the wall and he goes, yeah. I'm like, all right, take it out slow. Don't make any sudden moves. Take it out, put it on the hood of the car. And I, hand to God, he reaches down the front of his pants and pulls out a six inch hot pink spiked penis extension and drops it on the hood of the car. I'm like, you're just walking around with that on? He's like, I was going to my girlfriend's house. I'm like, why didn't you put it on there? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, by the way, I'm not touching that. Put that in this bag. Yes. Yes. Here, here, hold, hold the bag up. Uh, right on the hood of the car, I'm like, oh you got <laughs> I was thrilled to death when we finally got patrol cars that had the solid plastic uh, back seats for the inmates that you could just hose out. Uh, because I used to scare the shit out of me to stick my hand down in the, the seat looking for crap that got hidden in the cars. You found all <laughs> kinds of stuff from pocket knives to needles to toys and Oh yeah, vibrators and everything else under the sun would be stuffed down in your seat. Like I know this ain't mine. You know, you can't tell me you didn't put that there. No, no, no. Welcome to Woodwalkers. This hey, is what we specialize in. If, if, if y'all can't watch our show and at least get a smile or a laugh, y'all didn't watch somebody else. Uh, I the one of the funniest things I've ever oh seen. God, I love this guy. <laughs> hey, we we went to a house and. The there was a grown couple living with her mother. She calls she calls nine one one says, "Hey, huh, my daughter and son in law is in there using drugs. Y'all send somebody out here." So we go out. We roll up. We're like four cars deep. We roll up, go in. She's like, "Yep, they're they're in there doing drugs." Boom, boom, boom on the door. Well, it takes them forever. They unlock the bedroom door and come out, and it's like smoke rolling out. And uh, we're like, "Where's your stuff?" Oh, we ain't got none. We ain't got, well, yeah, come on out here. We detained them. We walk in there, and the mother's like, look, they got it, da da which, you know, we could smell it. We're in there. We're, we're like, looking through all their stuff. Buddy of mine, <laughs> the other officer, there's a, a big chest of drawers. It's up, like, you know, up this high on me. 
Well, he's got his he's got his big mag light and he's shining and you're not wanting to touch nothing. And he's yeah. like shining his light real good. And he's like, he pulls the drawer open and there's all kind of creepy stuff in this drawer. And he's wanting to like dig through it, but he don't want to stick his hand in there. Well, he's looking at like the ambient light off of his flashlight is like on top of this thing. So he just kind of like looks up. I'm standing just like two feet from him. Well, I see him reach up and he grabs this flashlight that's laying on top and he's using it like this, you know, like it's sticking down and he's rooting around. And all of a sudden he stops and he turns his light to his hand. And he like throws it down. Well, what he had grabbed and didn't look at really good. That wasn't a flashlight, but it was about that long. <laughs> well, he's rooting around in there. And they had this thing laying up on top. Well, he thought it was a big, long black flashlight. Well, it weren't a flashlight. And it's hanging on to it, just rooting around in the drawer. Man, I used to tell the rookie officers all the time, for the love of God, put gloves on. Yes, <laughs> thank you later. Oh, yeah. Uh, have a respectable, noted Bigfoot personal author, no less. Have him on the show. Hey. And this <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, I, we get great stories and great stories. <laughs> I, I, can tell you, I can tell you some that probably shouldn't be told on the air, too. <laughs> oh, well, by all means. By all means. <sighs> well, I, we'll have to invite him back to one of our after hours to hang oh, out yeah. with us. Well, there, there's some that probably should not be shared on, 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 a, on a public forum. Oh, okay, <laughs> I've tell <it> not. <laughs> yeah, you wait till one of our nighttime shows. That's a good time for that. Yeah. Uh, so, how'd you go from being a cop and knowing that these things are real to, you know, doing stories about them and having your YouTube channel and contributing with Cam and, you know, all the stuff that you do now that everybody knows you for. Well, I, I've wanted to be a writer since I was a kid, and I released my first 10, 12 books while I was still a cop, but none of them were, were cryptid related. I had a zombie series and a sci-fi series, uh, but I, I've, I've wanted to do cryptid related for a long time. I just kind of shied away from it. Uh, but, you know, like I said, you know, I've been into cryptid since I was a kid, and it's something that's always fascinated me. And, and, and uh, since I've always wanted to be a writer, the, the, the meshing of those two just seemed logical to me. Um, but, uh, you know, after, after, my ba after I got hurt with my back and I, I couldn't go out and, 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 and find weird things on people in pat searches anymore, um, you know, when I, uh, when I realized that, day, you know, it was time to retire and I had to, to find other, other recourse and I started putting all my energy into my writing, uh, my friend Steve and I, Steve Monrotis, who we call Wild Man, he's, uh, he's one of the co-hosts of the show. Him and I were talking one night, and I'm like, we should start a podcast. And he's like, what the hell is a podcast? So I, I explained to him what a podcast was. He goes, well, what we call it? And we were we were just jokingly referring to it as two assholes, no waiting, because we were just going to you know, get, have a few glasses of whiskey and make fun of crap. Uh, but then we started talking cryptids, and him and I went out to an area and had an experience and, um, you know, from that point on, we were like, you know what, let's start talking about weird crap in Missouri. And the original name of the channel was Ozark's Haunted Pathways. Uh, but then after about six months, I changed the name of the show to DAX Machina, which is an alliteration to my to my writing career. Ex Machina or Deus Ex Machina is a writing trope. It's if you ever watched a story. And you, you see, you know, the character does something incredibly stupid and you know this guy is going to die. But like light from the heavens comes down and something miraculous happens and saves their life. That's known as deus ex machina. Uh, you know, it's called in Latin, it means machine of the gods. And I, 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 I like that writing trope. And uh, I, I thought it was funny. And by, by applying my name to that, it became D.A. ex machina, you know, machine of D.A. Well, that's one uh, way to go with that. I've got, I've just got to throw down the same question that I've asked him like over and over. Man, when, when is somebody going to oh. wake up and turn y'all stuff into a movie? I would love that. That would be so fantastic. Uh, you know, if, if I could crowdfund it, I'd do it myself. 
because I know people in the special effects industry. I, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, so I could do the screenplay. Uh, yeah, I know quite a few people. My wife used to direct plays when she was in school. So, you know, I've got, I know quite a few people that could probably pull off a low budget production. Um, so, but I, I would love to be able to do that. I would love to see short stories or even the full novels made in, made into movies. Well, my deal is even the stuff that comes out that that's not particularly like a super low budget. They have no plot. There's no storyline. It's a sand crap. And, you know, it's just, it's the same thing. And nobody's got any imagination. They don't know anything about even nothing to do with any kind of actual reports or anything. They're right. just the same stuff. And it's, it's horrible. I can't stand to watch it, but yet I can listen. I can listen to Kim read off wild hunt or, or any of your stuff. And in my head, I, I'm in a total different zone. I can see it as it's happening. I, I enjoy that better than I do those movies. Well, so, thank you. So that, that's, hope, that's high praise for a writer. Eh? That's the best you can hope for. The whole Steve Lilly thing. Look, if if HBO, HBO, if anybody that works for HBO ever happens to see this, pick up the Steve Lilly line and run with that. You can, you can branch off into DA stuff, you could branch off. There's so much you could do with that. And the writing is so good. It's like, for those of us that listen to Bigfoot shows and everything, we get tired of just constantly listening to people talk about Bigfoot. I know that's disheartening, but it's true. The, the stories, though, whenever we know that it's just like purely entertainment, and we're just engrossed in it, listening to what's going to happen next, you know, that's like a that's like our vacation from the Bigfoot shows and everything. And man, y'all stories are the ones I've read of your or listened to of yours are great. Of course, Thank I've you. listened to a lot of cams. They're great. Cam I just, writer. He is, but I just, I think it's such a wasted thing that it's only a, a YouTube podcast. You know, it could, they could do so much more. If nothing I'd else, see it more. I really would. If I'd nothing love. else, the people that write, that write TV shows nowadays, they need to stop and come be schooled by y'all for a little while and then go back to their TV production career because man stuff has gotten boring. You guys man. can ask my wife. It drives her nuts to watch a law enforcement or a military movie with me because I'm like, nope, that's wrong. Nope, that's wrong. <laughs> and the other the other day we were watching, I don't remember what it was, it was CSI or law or, or law and order or something. We were watching some cop drama and uh the, the this guy got tased and it, it knocked him out and my wife just pauses it stops for a second looks at me and goes i hate you I'm like why <laughs> he goes because of you i know tasers don't knock people out and now i can't stand this <laughs> like no they don't knock people out they hurt but they don't knock people out yeah they'll slow them down i have i have hit guys that just look me in the eye and pulled the leads out that's what we call a brown pants moment. <laughs> yeah, it's we, time uh, to get something other than we, a taser. We hit a guy with pepper spray and a taser one night. Turned out he was on bath salts. And uh, mm. I'm, at the time, you know, 5'10", 250. And this guy grabbed me by the front of my carrier and threw me over the hood of a car like I didn't weigh an ounce. Yeah. And he wasn't a big dude. He was maybe 200 pounds. Those bath salts were crazy when all that was going on. When we finally got him in cuffs, the six of us that got him, we looked like we'd been through a war. We were all beat to hell. Every last one of us. That that right there in itself is what the average civilian doesn't understand unless you've been an officer. It, look, when you're dealing with these people, they'll say, uh, like these videos, They'll see a, a big officer, and they'll see this guy's normal size or whatever, and they'll say, well, well, why did he tase him? Why did he do this? Why did he wind up having to shoot him? Most of those clips don't show the 20 minutes that he's been wrestling this guy and can't do nothing with him. Right. Y'all, I mean, I'm not a little bitty guy either, but I, me and two other officers trying to get cuffs on a dude that weighed probably a buck 40 or was about five foot eight, and we've done wrestled him for 20 minutes, and we're, we're like three of us trying to hold him down. 
And this dude's basically doing push-ups in a ditch with us riding on his back. You can't. And and after we finally didn't get him in cuffs, he's over there about to break the chain on the cuffs behind his back, and his teeth are gritting and his teeth are cracking because he's he's just so jacked up. And I know you probably dealt with them, but one of the worst things I've dealt with with people on, I'd rather deal with three on methamphetamine as I had one on synthetic marijuana. Yeah, that kratom stuff. Ooh, oh, yeah. I've seen people absolutely flip out on that stuff. Yep. And, you know, be, a, be not, even, not even a big dude. And yep. you know, he's more than a handful than you can, and, and you can deal with. Speaking of pepper spray, let me tell y'all a story about my kids in Taco Bell. <laughs> so, so I, went to, I went to the grocery store two days ago. My kids don't ever get fast food. And they had Taco Bell one time, like last year or something. They love the soft tacos, you know. And my youngest, she wanted to try some of the hot sauce. And she's sitting in the passenger seat. My oldest is in the back seat, and I'm driving, obviously. And she can't get the hot sauce open. She can't get the packet open. So while I'm driving, I'm merging onto the highway. I reach over, grab the pack of hot sauce, tear it open. I'm driving. About 20 seconds later, as I'm getting up to 70 mile an hour, I don't know, I wipe my eye or something like that, and I must have had hot sauce on it. I got a mouthful of dip. The hot sauce made my eyes blur, and then I sneezed, and the dip shot out on the windshield in front of the steering wheel like 12 patterns of bird spray. And I'm wiping my eyes and swerving. I can't see through the windshield. My kids are screaming at me. And Tinsley's going, the Cokes, the Cokes, because the Cokes in the back seat are flying all over everywhere and everything. Anyway, that's my story. I hope y'all enjoyed that. Go <laughs> you see yourself, basically. Yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad a cop wasn't there whenever I was cutting across lanes of traffic. But I sprayed an old boy one night, and he looked at me, and he wiped his eyes and went, is that the best you got? I'm like, nope. Oh, shit. Pop. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's not. Golly. Phaser did the trick. Oh, see, he didn't even didn't even bother. Didn't phase. And Greg, Greg, I tell you, in order to be certified in OC, you've got to show you've got to show demonstrate the ability to not only be hit with it, but to fight through it. And if we can do it, someone else can do it. And yeah, so right. we we go into that knowing this might not stop them. And you yeah. know, things like bear spray and stuff that people carry when out in the woods. I try to tell people. That is not the be all end all. It may not stop it. It may just piss it off. Like, oh no, this stuff will drop a man in his tracks. I'm like, okay. So don't you know, don't tell me you haven't been warned. But the stuff we carried on our duty belts was made by Fox Labs. They measure this stuff in, in Scoville heat units. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the stuff you can buy at Walmart, uh, like keep on your keychains about ten thousand Scovilles. The stuff that Bear Spray sells, like a Cabela's and Bass Pro, that's about 25,000 Scovilles. The stuff we carried on our duty belt was made by Fox Labs. You had to have law, and law enforcement credentials to even get it. Mm -hmm. it, it was not available to civilians. It was 5.3 million Scoville co heat units, and I've seen people shrug that off. You yeah, could cool. spray it in a styrofoam cup, and it would eat the bottom out of the cup. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about it, they ate. Have you ever have you ever been on a scene where where you sprayed somebody or somebody else sprayed somebody? You're gonna get it too. I, oh yeah, I, if you're yeah. fighting somebody and that gets deployed, yeah, you're you're wearing a good chunk of that home. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna get it too. I mean, the officers gonna get it. People think, well, it's just directed. No, no, no it's it's, it's, it's an it's, area of effect weapon. You yeah, never it, walk, never get out of your car and go. <clears throat> somebody sprayed. <laughs> yes, you can sir. just taste it. Yeah. You get out and you're like, oh, oh God, it, there's no sea in the area. Glove up. It, it, it's bad. A lot of times if you just got a transport one or if you're in a patrol car that's transporting, I mean, it, that stuff just fogs everywhere. Oh, yeah. It's, it's oh, good for everybody. It's the last for time everybody. I got sprayed, uh, my wife was laughing at me because I, I would, as a, as a corporal, I would get sprayed with my rookies because I thought it was important they saw somebody else other than just the, the newbies getting sprayed. Yeah. That way they know it's not not BS that you know the senior officers are doing it have done it too. So I would I've been sprayed God probably 15, 20 times. 
Um, but, but the last time I got sprayed, they were using some stuff that was, they were just trying out. It was like worse than anything I'd been hit with before. And I was sitting on my couch with a box fan in my lap with it blowing in my face going, ah, and my wife's like, you're an idiot. You were too old to go out there and like get sprayed with that crap. I'm like, I think maybe you're right. I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get a shit. All the people that we have that are law enforcement, we're going to get a show and just let y'all talk about all that kind of stuff. Bama's in here right now. Roger yeah. used to be hey, your Bama's deputy. Bama's right, Bama's right right there. What he's talking about, exactly. If you if if you spray somebody, you better be sidestepping because when they can't see, they're going to blindly come at where they remember you being. Yeah, you better be so moving. You do is spray and move. Spray and move. Spray and move. <laughs> yep. Well, we, uh, we were fighting this guy one night, and uh, there's four or five of us piled onto this guy, and he grabbed his hands like this underneath him and held them, and we were trying to get his arms out and to no avail. I mean, we were trying everything. I was hitting him and hitting him in the in the common peroneal on his thigh, trying to you're know, trying to break his concentration. Cause that hurts. That peroneal nerve in your thigh hurts like a bastard. But he would not give up his hands. So finally, I just leaned down and whispered in his ear, and his arms whoo right out to his side, and they cuff him up. And when we got him cuffed up, stuffed in the car, my sergeant goes, what the hell did you just say to that guy? I said, I just pointed out some logical explanations to him. Like, what do you mean logical explanations? I said, I just pointed out that it is physically impossible for his eyeball and my thumb to occupy that socket at the same time. <laughs> He's like, well, God dang, don't put that in the report. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's not going in. Don't worry. Uh, work, work, though. Yeah, got his hands. <laughs> well, of of all the of all the stuff that you've written about and with your background, every first of all, let me ask you this: Do you have people that uh, email you or call you and tell you stories, like yeah, like give you inside stuff? Is there is there any of that 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 they've called and told you or emailed you, and you're like, wow, that's really impressive? Um, I, I, dude, I've heard some fantastic stories through the years. Um, but probably the best one, uh, was told to me by a guy that I, I used to deer hunt with his son. I mean, I knew the guy since I was a kid, told us a story at deer camp one year. And we always used to make fun of him because he carried the biggest damn rifle you ever saw going deer hunting. I'm like, Jesus Christ, what do you want? Pretenderized? <laughs> he's like no no there's just other stuff out here but he always carried like you know something bigger than a seven millimeter magnum i mean he carried the biggest damn rifle he could afford and we're all out there with like 223s and crap like that he's he's like boys one of these days you're going to run into something you're going to wish you had something bigger but he would never elaborate well one night at deer camp uh, not long before he passed away we were we we're all drinking some uh, some missouri corn squeezings if you know what i mean and um he uh, he had a few, and he told us the story. Uh, so apparently, uh, he was a big morel mushroom hunter. Uh, he loved going out every every year when the, when the, when the, when the when the mushrooms were out, and uh, would just get as many as he could find. Him and his wife loved them, and uh, when he, any they had left over, they'd give to family. And the woods behind his house, he had he had about seventy acres. And it was right up against some conservation land. So he would always hop the fence, go over in the conservation land. He always found plenty. Um, so one day he goes out, takes his four-wheeler out to the edge of the property. His dog went with him and hopped the fence, went back into the area where he'd been hunting for years from, for mushrooms. And he's getting, you know, getting quite a few in a bag and uh, looking around and noticed that the place was really quiet. And which was unusual. There was usually a lot of lot of lot of little squirrel chatter and other animals. But to notice the place was real quiet, and the dog was sticking close to him. He says, this this dog was known for just ranging all over the area while he hunted mushrooms, but it stayed with him. He said, "Well, that's when I started, you know, like noticing that just how weird things were." He said, "Well, I got I had a pretty good bag full of the of this. I was going to pick a few more and just get out of there." He said, "So I lean over." And a rock goes whizzing by me. He says, and I'm not talking any rock. He said, it wasn't some park, a park ranger or, or other hunter out there trying to scare me off. He said, this rock was as big as a football. 
Wow. And he's, it went whizzing past me. He said, so I, I grabbed my pistol and looked around. I didn't see a damn thing. I didn't I couldn't see where the rock came from. I didn't know didn't know who threw it or what threw it or if it fell. He said, there's nothing out there. There's no noise. He said, and the dog's growling, got a tackles up. He said, and it was a pretty good sized uh, size dog. It was a terrier. So it was probably 30, 35 pounds. And um, it, you know, it was staying with him, had a tackles up. And he's like, all right, I'm going to get out of here. He saw one last bunch of morals. He starts to grab them. He said, and then I heard the zip of the rock. He says, and before I could move, it hit me in the head. And uh, he said, I must have blacked out. He said, uh, you know, I, I, I came when I came to I, my soul side of my face was sticky and I felt like I was moving. He yeah. said, and I I opened my eyes and I looked up and this thing about about eight feet tall and covered in dark brown hair was dragging me by the ankle through the woods. Mm. And uh, I, and I'm, of course, we're all just absolutely riveted. And uh, he said, so I shot it. I pulled my, 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 my 357 and I shot it right in the back. He said, well, needless to say, it let go and it took off screaming in the woods. He said, so I get up and he says, my mushrooms are gone. The dog's gone. He says, all I've got is my pistol. He says, and I kind of got my bearings on where I was at and headed for the, for the property line. He says, so I get to, I get to my, I get to my, I get to the property line is I just basically dove over the fence. He said, and all the while I'm hearing limbs snapping around me on multiple sides. I'm hearing, you know, like walnuts and, and rocks whizzing past me. He said, I, I got hit two or three times, just like in the shoulder and the back as I'm running. He said, I get on the, on the four wheeler. He said, now I'm on my property. He said, I get on the four wheeler, fired up, turn around, head for the house. He said, and I look ahead of me, he says, and a deadfall tree about the diameter of a bowling ball is falling across the trail. I said, what'd you do? He goes, well, I knew if that thing fell, I was done. He said, so I gunned it. He says, I, I hit that thing as I was going past it. It bent the handlebars on my on my my four wheeler. Damn near raked, raked me off of it. He said, but I managed to get under that thing before before it got me trapped. He said, and I went straight back to the house, went inside, got the biggest rifle I had, and sat out there. And he said, for a week after that, I'd hear them things gibbering out in the woods. He said, they're out there, and that's why I carry a big rifle. Holy shit. Yeah, he he said he, he came to do with it dragging and uh, dragging him off, and uh, you know for, until he passed away, he still had a great big old scar inside of his head where he got hit with that rock. We always used to ask him how he got the scar; he wouldn't tell us. So what what time frame would that have been? Guessing year wise, I right there when the mushrooms are when the mushrooms are. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like twenty years ago, ten years ago. How, how far back? That when he he said it happened to him when I was basically in junior high and I, I'd been asking about it for years. So this happened about 1986, 87. Uh, I could take you right to the spot and I've been out there and it's still not developed. It is still all farmland, but it doesn't belong to his family anymore, but I could wow. take you right to the spot. It is just outside of Lebanon, Missouri. If you, um, if you look at Lebanon, Missouri on the map and then follow 32 highway out toward Roby, Missouri, it's out near a little bitty ass town called Falcon. Wow. If, if when I say Falcon, it's tiny, it's what we call a poking plum town. You poke your head out the window, you're plumb through it. There you go. <laughs> wow. If it was Morels, it was early spring, you know, March, April, somewhere like that. And hey, maybe boogers like Morels and they decided that a uh, side of human would go good with it. Who side, knows? side of long pig. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they had planned, his but was gone and his bag of mushrooms were gone, and he he said he'd been hunting for hours, so he had so quite. A few. Did he? Did the dog ever come back? Nope, never saw the dog again. Hey. He said the nearest he can figure is when he got hit in the head with the rock and went down. The dog tried to defend him, and they probably killed it. Wow. But well, he never saw would, the dog again. Why would you? Why would you bother with the dog if you had a whole person that you could carry off? You know, light snack. I mean, if you, you know, you know, if you're uh, filling your freezer for the winter, you know, you're you're laying in, and you've got a deer. It doesn't mean you're going to pass up on a couple of squirrels. That's yeah. right. Uh, you ever hear? Do you know who Dallas Gilbert was? I know the name. I don't know them personally. He, he had a story very similar to that. Uh, he and Wayne were out in 
pretty sure they were in West Virginia whenever it happened. They were setting out their recorders, and uh, Dallas was going down there checking the microphones. At that point, they had the cables that ran between the microphones and the, the recording device, and uh, Dallas Gilbert supposedly, supposedly the story goes that he got snatched. So uh, I think Wayne saw it, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and then and then he he stopped talking about it publicly. But he said that a booger region, Dallas was down on the ground covering a microphone with leaves at the base of a tree. A booger reached its arm around the side of the tree, twisted his head real quick, pop. Dallas was out. I guess the booger thought he killed him. Threw Dallas over his shoulder. Started walking away. Dallas came to. Had a Ruger Red Hawk in the holster. And just stuck it up against whatever was carrying him. And pulled the trigger. Which they were out there investigating boogers. So, I mean, yeah. he knew what it was. Pulled the trigger. The thing screamed and dropped him and ran away. And I'll tell you right now, all of the interviews and all the stuff with Dallas after that was never the same. That man was never the same after that happened. So I tend to believe that is true. If y'all don't know about that, you can still find stuff about it on YouTube. Kind of, you got to kind of piece it together. It's miscellaneous videos with Wayne mostly. Yeah, that's one of the things I, that I, I think kind of gives me a little bit of an edge. Uh, and I'm sure Greg will agree with me on this. Being a cop, having the training we have, when you interview somebody, there are things we can look for when you're when you're interrogating somebody that will let you know if they're being deceptive. And there, there are also some very key elements you can look for that absolutely confirm this person is reliving a nightmare. And yep. yeah, I, I have I've really relied on that instinct a lot uh, to, to kind of weed out the stories that are, you know, a, a little more questionable from the ones that I absolutely want to go back to where that happened. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, there's man. When you know, when somebody especially if you're sitting there face to face in person and they start telling you that and you can watch the goosebumps pop up on their skin, you can see their eyes start tearing up. You can see them, you know, start to stutter. I mean, you you can pick up on it really quick. I mean, it, you and there's a there is a difference. And y'all, when when you have some of these really traumatic deals, it. I mean, I, I've told people on this show right here and on several shows. There's some of these encounters that that I'll tell y'all that's happened to me that I can't let myself mentally get in that moment and stay in it because it messes me up for a day or two. I'm talking about, I'll have, I'll get talking about it. And when I dive off into it, I'm reliving. I'm not just telling y'all what happened. It washes over me to the point that I may have horrible dreams for a week because I go back and, and that's, that's a bad place that it puts me in and it's tough to talk about. Yeah. I, I've heard Greg on the phone kind of get choked up and slow down because he has to collect himself whenever he has told me, because you know me, I mean, I'm a jerk and I ask Greg like all the gory details about some kinds of stuff and he'll get into it and he'll relive it. And I've heard other people do that too. And that's, I mean, that's how I get when I talk about the, the night I nearly got my skull stomped in by a, by a guy we were arresting. Hey, I, what happened? That, that was a bad night. Wow. Uh, fortunately, there was another officer there. Um, Greg, you know when you can when you look at somebody, when you watch their eyes, you can see that mental switch flip when they're about to about to about to move. I didn't oh, yeah. see it. That wow. I never saw that switch flip, and I watched for that. Yeah. That guy went from dead calm to not to on us, just in like that, just like that. And uh, I got me down, kicked me in the head multiple times. And, uh, you know, I, I, but apparently I never dropped out of the fight, even though I don't remember it. Uh, we, we, the, my, the other officer I was with gets the guy on the ground. I dog pile on him. We get him cuffed up. But the next clear memory I have is of leaning against a wall while an EMT is shining a light in my eyes. They're like, he's got a concussion. We need to get his ass to the hospital right now. And, wow. Uh, they, I, uh, I went for about four weeks not being able to remember my kids' names. I had a pretty severe concussion. 
no, thought, thought it was thought it was the end of my career. That dude damn near stomped my skull in. And uh, when when I talk about it, I still get a little love. I, I I still have those moments where I can just see that lat foot, and it it it, it kind of freaks me out. I mean, it, it it's not not a moment of my life I like to relive. Uh, but it yeah the, it it's it's those moments. It's like PTSD. It really is. You you relive that moment in the moment when you think about it, and uh, it's it, it's not my proudest moment, not my happiest moment, but I'm glad I survived. Yeah. Y'all, both y'all have seen, you know, uh, traumatic stuff and, and kind of the worst side of people, humanity, you know, how violent and aggressive and everything can get and everything. You feel more comfortable dealing with boogers than a drug addled you know, criminal on, on the worst day. What do you think? I mean, compare the two boogers. Look what you were just talking about DA with the guy that, you know, Hey, you wake up and something's dragging you through the woods and there ain't no good outcome to that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you wasn't taking him for tea and crumpets. That's right. So, I mean, you put a round into him, but you both know about boogers. Would you rather deal with boogers or would you rather deal with some of the jerk faces that you deal with on the day-to-day -day thing in law enforcement? You know, I, I think I would rather deal with the creatures. I really would. Uh, people on drugs are unpredictable. Uh, humans are unpredictable. Um, I've, and I've seen the evil that, you know, that humanity can have. Um, I would rather because even you know when you're going out going out looking for signs of boogers and things like that, or dog man or anything along those lines, there there's a certain natural order of things, and uh, I'll take I'll take a bad day in the woods over a good day chasing bad guys any time of the, any day of the week. I don't blame you. Well, I mean I've told y'all a bunch of times. I mean I I've, <laughs> I've rolled around in the ditch with folks. I've been on felony warrants and drug raids and. You know, been shot at a few times, uh, but I've never, I've never had. Which most of the time, a lot of that happens so fast. It's you have it, and a lot of times you don't have time to get scared. Now, like like these boogers. I mean, I've told y'all, I've I've had more fear go through me right here in these woods than I have on, you know, on a lot of the law enforcement stuff. But y'all, it, it to me, it's is equally dangerous. Is or well, people are probably more prevalently dangerous because you're not going to be dealing with boogers as much. But there, there again, that's why I try to stress to everybody. I'm not telling anybody don't go to the woods, live in fear of going out and researching or whatever. But do not go out there with it in your head that these things are a big stuffed teddy bear and they just need some love. No. You, if if you had if you was out west where they've got a big population of grizzlies, or you know there's a grizzly, are you That's gonna right. run it and, and try to hold a damn Oreo out and let it That's eat out? Right. Of meat? Are you gonna provoke it? Well, hey, I bet there's a grizzly here. Let me make some noise and see if I can draw it in. That don't I'll make. Pet that dog. <laughs> yeah, we, we tell people on our channel. I'll pet that dog. Pet that dog. I'm gonna I'm gonna copy that video and put it on our channel. I won't pet that yeah. out. On our channel, we tell people all the time, uh, just because you, you, you're you going out to, to the woods and you, you're looking for a cryptid, doesn't mean you're not going to run into something else. There's plenty of things in the woods that will hurt you or kill you that yes, have sir. nothing to do with cryptids. That's You've got right. snakes, yeah. bears, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, you know, I'll and that's the greater right. North American meth head. You, yes, you stumble sir. upon an illegal grow or a, or a hidden, hidden uh, meth lab, and they'll kill you. Oh, yes, sir. Hey, yeah. uh, for, first of all, house, check your text message. Uh, so, DA, what is your favorite story that you've told? I don't know if I've got a just an in general favorite. Do you mean like the books or actual encounter stories? Uh, 
I mean, well, I guess you could combine them both. I'm more familiar with your your actual stories that are on YouTube and everything. But like, uh, just pick the top two or three, and what inspired you to like create them? Talk about them? Was there some real stuff behind it? What? Uh, well, my my book series, the Lakeview Man series. Uh, the first book of the Lakeview Man uh, is set down near Table Rock Lake. And uh, that got started because of conversation with an officer that worked down in that area. There's an abandoned campground down there. The Army Corps of Engineers shut down years ago. It's all completely overgrown, but it's still there. You can still get back into it. It's called the Joe Balt Recreation Area. And an officer I knew went down in there one night. He was a, he was a county deputy. He wasn't a, wasn't a city, city boy. And, and if you worked a county, you know, if you've got backup of reports, you'll find a quiet place to park and knock your reports out. Well, he pulled down in this old campground, backed up into a, one of the campground spaces, and started banging out his report. And he said he kept just feeling like something was there. And he kept looking around, didn't see anything. He had his windows up and the AC on. It was in the summer. And this was in a, this was in a Dodge Charger. I see he goes back to his reports. And all of a sudden, something hit the back of the Charger. He said, not like trying to push it, but something came down on the trunk deck hard enough to bottom the suspension out. And he hit the brake and looked in the mirror and he said, I looked back and all I could see was a hairy chest. He said it was massive. Didn't see the head, didn't see the lower half. I saw from about here to about navel on this thing. And it has caved in my trunk deck. And I said, what'd you do? He said, I threw that thing in gear and I got the hell out of there. He said, I wasn't going to try to arrest something like that. He said, the worst part was having to explain to my to my, to my my uh, supervisor how the, cave, the trunk deck of my car got caved in. He said, but I don't know what the hell that thing was, but I will not go back to that park after dark now. He said, there's something down there. And uh, he showed me the pictures. Yeah, it did a lot of damage to the, the trunk deck. And to bottom the suspension out on a car takes some force. And uh, he refuses to go back down there. So th that area, that story about Joe Bald started sparking my interest in that area. And I started looking into that area and turned out that along that area of Table Rock Lake had been a lot of sightings. These are not sightings that show up on like the BFRO kind of things like that. These are local local stuff that people just talk about. Uh, There's fishermen. a lot of stuff that doesn't show up on the BFRO. Right. Yeah, these, these aren't in some network of, of uh, sighting reports somewhere. These are just, you got to know somebody that knows the area and that kind of thing. You all know how it is. You talk to folks and they tell you, well, this happened to my cousin over here in this in this, in this this little slough and things like that. So I started talking to folks in that area and found out there were a lot of stuff going on down around the shores of Table Rock Lake. So, you know, I, I started finding out there was a lot to do with that, that Joe Bald campground. Uh, so I started researching the first Lakeview Man book, and my buddy Steve, uh, Steve Monrotis, that, that one of my co-hosts, him and I start pulling research on that park, specifically on Joe Bald. And we found eight or nine missing persons associated with the campground. And then, and then the Army Corps of Engineers shuts it down in, in 1999. Shut it down completely. Uh, and this is this is a vacation destination in Missouri where an acre of ground goes for upwards of one hundred fifty thousand dollars. And this is about 100 acres right on the lake. They shut it down, won't let it sell, won't let it reopen. Kimberling City has tried multiple times to reopen Joe Bald every time the Army Corps of Engineers shuts them down. So we find these missing persons and we're like, holy shit, there's something really big going on down here at Joe Bald. So. Steve and I, my wife and his wife, we all go down to Joe Bald. And uh, it's like my nine like about eight or nine o'clock at night. It's dark. It was I think it was in October of 17, 17 or 18. We go down there and it, no, no, it was it was 19. It was when I was writing Lakeview, man. I'm sorry. Um, so we go down there and we're gonna show we're, we're, we're the plan was to shoot just a few minutes of video footage of me talking about Joe Bald and the upcoming novel, The Lakeview Man. And it was just going to be to put out on my channel, put out on Facebook to kind of drum up interest for the book. It's all it was intended to be, just a little little minute-long promo video for Lakeview Man. Steve and I go down there. The girls stay in the car. Steve and I are both armed. I was still a cop at the time. Steve's a concealed carrier. He's a former cop, but he's a nurse now. 
Steve's carrying, I'm carrying. Steve's filming, I'm out there literally with this exact light. My ProTac HL5, it's 3,500 lumens, super That's bright. Great light. It is a very bright light. And I'm shining it out in the woods and I'm talking about it, talking about Joe Bald. And uh, we don't really think too much of it. I mean, we just shoot this little video and the video is still up on my YouTube channel. Yeah, you and you can watch it. It's called the Joe uh, Joe Bald video, or you can watch the other one's called the Joe Bald breakdown video, which is when after we discovered something. So Steve and I don't think any more of it. We put the video up, kind of forget about it. It's like a commercial for the books. A year later, I was doing a show called The Nightmare Hunter, and was on was on the show, and we showed that clip to promote the book because the book was out by this point. One of the guys in the audience, a guy named Thomas Whitney points out he said hey da something moved behind you in the trees and i'm like no i've watched that video a thousand times there's nothing back there and again this is shot on a cell phone just as a book promo we weren't out there looking for anything we weren't out there with high-end cameras trying to film something creepy in the woods it was just intended to be a 20 30 second you know promo spot for a book so i go back and I start looking at it, and at the front of time frame where he says, and I, I'm like, sure enough, something back there moves, but it's it's a cell phone video. So I get a hold of a couple guys I know that do video enhancement and video analysis. And I send it over to, to Josh and Adam, sent, the, sent the, the original just straight off the phone video, you know, nothing that had been uploaded and then downloaded, just, you know, sent the, the original copy straight over to him. A couple days pass, and uh, Josh calls me. He's like, Hey, you sitting down? I'm like, can be. Why? He's like, you better sit down. I'm like, okay. He said, all right, take a look at this. And he starts sending me isolated stills from the book, from the video. In the video, at one point, you see me play my light out across the woods as I'm talking to the camera. And I play the light back across the woods. And you can clearly see something with a wolf like head lean out from behind a tree and then lean back. We went to the exact spot, found the exact tree. There are no bushes around there. There's nothing that it could have been, could have been like foliage. There was no wind. And it was nine and a half feet off the ground where this thing came out. Showed the video to MK Davis. He said, it's a cell phone video. I can't enhance it too terribly much, but there is definitely something behind you. I sent it to Nick Valente, who was with a group called the North American Dogman Project at the time. Yep. And, uh, and I sent it to Nick. And Nick had it for about three hours. He call in and calls me. He's like, he's like, dude, I've got this up on the big screen in my living room. He said, you've got a dog man in the woods behind you. I'm like, you're, no, you're shitting me. I, that's, that's not a dog. That's not a dog man. There's, I, there's something back there, but I, I don't think it's a dog man. He goes, dude, watch it on a large screen. So between the enhanced stills from Josh and then watching it on our big TV in the living room, you can clearly see you and actually one still. You can see its arm on the side of the tree with claws and a head that looks like a timber wolf lean out from behind the tree. And when the K, when the light comes back toward it, it ducks back behind the tree out of the way. And it was less than 30 yards from us. And we never saw it. Wow. Oh, that's a Brown moment there. When oh. Steve and I, oh. when I showed the, 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 uh, the uh, pictures to Steve, uh, we were, we were sitting at his, his dining room table. He looks at the pictures doesn't say a word, gets up, goes over to the decanter, grabs two glasses, fills them with whiskey, hands me one, sets the other one down, goes, play it again. And it, it still freaks both of us out because we were, and I, like I said, I was an active cop. I'm a trained observer. I'm trained to look for signs of danger. And that thing was within 30 feet of us, and I, and I never saw it. Well, you might be a trained cop, but these things are, they grow up in the woods. And they are trying saw, to there are multiple places in the video where you can see eye shine. He said yeah. we caught one of them on camera, and he believed there were at least five other individuals in that can in the in the film. But it, I, I, oh, I, I definitely see the eye shine, and you know, you guys know damn good and well you're going to see eye shine in the woods at night. So I, I don't know if I put a lot of whole st stock in what Nick says that there's multiples, but I can damn sure say that the thing that leans out behind the tree will give you chills. Wow. Is is that available on your YouTube channel? Yeah, it's on my YouTube channel. If you go, oh, let me go over there and I'll I'll just send you the link. Uh, 
I'm God. It's called the Joe Bald Breakdown video. What about that, Jesse? <laughs> And yeah. the breakdown video shows the stills that were enhanced. Uh, you, you, there's, you can see the one with the arm. Um, and again, remember, it was shot on a cell phone with no intention of, shine, of, of videoing stuff like that. So it's kind of grainy, uh, but you, you look at it, and you'll, you're going to see it. Joe Parker said he's seen it. The video yeah. is called Possible Evidence, the Joe Bald Breakdown video. And I'm gonna send you guys the. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reply to your email that you sent me the link for this. Okay. And just send it right there. And I will put it. I will add it to the uh, the description. Just so just everybody. Knows, just so everybody knows, uh, DA's links are in the description. Uh, there's the whole bio and the links and everything. So you can go check it out over there and I will add this part to it just so everybody knows exactly what he is talking about. Yeah. So that Joe Bald area is active. Uh, about a yeah. year ago, uh, I met a guy. Um, I, I, I don't have permission to use his name, so I'm not going to say his name. Uh, but he, he says, hey, can I ask you a question? I know you're into, the, into this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay. He said, can you tell me what looks like a gigantic wolf but can get up on its hind legs he says I, I don't believe in werewolves and crap like that what is it i said well you know some folks call it a dog man there are a lot of terms for it maybe people have been seeing it for a long time so why do you ask he said well he said i was he, he's I, he plays music uh, he's a musician he said i was out at some friend's house we were playing music together practicing for a, for a show and um he said my car wouldn't start so i had to borrow one of my friend's cars he said, no, normally I drive a pretty good sized car, but not, that, that night I borrowed a little Prius. He said, so I'm heading home in this car. He said, I'm not real familiar with the car. And it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not super responsive like I'm used to. He said, so I'm just driving along. And he says, I start noticing something on the side of the road. And he says, and it's running between houses. He says, at first I thought it was just a wolf. It was running on all fours. I said, okay. He said, it was completely black and it was pacing me. And uh, he said, and just as I about getting ready to turn, I, I see it come out from between the houses and then it darts out and hits the side of the car, hits the driver's side front quarter panel. He said, and it hit it hard enough to do damage. He said, I ended up paying almost $3,000 to fix their car. He said, then it stood up and tried to get in the door. I said, what happened? He said, well, I gave that little bastard all it had. He said, which ain't a lot for a Prius. He said, but I stomped on it and I just took off. He says, and that thing paced me until I got past 50 miles an hour. He said, it stayed right with me trying to get the door of the car open. He said, there were scratches all over the door. He didn't have any pictures of it. I said, we didn't wait to take pictures. He's like, I didn't think of it. I just wanted to get their car fixed and get it back to him. I felt bad because I damaged their car. He said, but this thing scared the hell out of me. I said, where did this happen, if you don't mind me asking? He goes, do you know where the old Joe Bald campground is down by Kimberling City? And I'm like, you don't say. Yeah, I know exactly where that's at. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot have, going on there. I would have liked to have interviewed him and asked him, you know, why he thought it was a wolf and not a dog and how did it try to get into the door. He because said the it, reason it, he thought it was a wolf because it was way too big to be a dog. How did it try to get into the door? Did you by ask? The time, said by the time it had hit the car, it had got it, once it hit the car, it got up. It was running next to the car on two legs and it kept grabbing at the door like it was trying to reach for the handle. It was running next to running the next car to him on two legs. legs. He said say, it stayed with him until he got to about 50 miles an hour. Say that's that's the exact kind of people that I love because that's the people that's not going to question why I've got a nine millimeter, a 357, and an AK in my truck. And more than one knife and a, you know, so probably a long gun. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Why is there an AK-47 laying on the console? Well, I might need that. Because you never know. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd, have, I'd have black market frags if I could find them. Uh, mm -hmm. RPG in the trunk. Anyway. So, hey, DA, since Jesse brought it up about the whole dog man thing. Mm -hmm. Going back 
and uh, everything. With what you were talking about, law enforcement, you had reason to believe, you know, the prowlers outside the house, seeing something run across the road in a squad car, all that kind of stuff. I can understand the booger thing. And then you capture the video that, that, you know, whatever it looks like, it's got dog man head and everything. Number oh, one, by the way, you guys are welcome to use that video on your show. If you guys want to want to break it down yourself, I, feel free to have a hunt. Oh, my, my complete permission, you know, it, it's my thanks. video and I don't want like, you know, history channel or anybody like that taking it, but other channels like y'all feel free. Well, we we may actually do like a little clip and say, this is what he's talking about. What do you think? What? I, maybe you don't feel the same way I do, but there is a big difference between going from, holy crap, boogers are real, to actually mentally processing dog man werewolves. I mean, right. whenever, whenever you get into that area, you're getting into horror movie stuff. I'm not saying that boogers ain't scary or anything like that, but dog man is the next level. I mean, let's face it. Boogers, boogers are big. They're scary. They're strong. They're not a nine foot tall wolf right. with teeth that have four inches long and claws and all that kind of stuff. I mean, realistically, those things are only made for one purpose, and that's to kill stuff. Uh, I mean, if, if, if we're just being honest about it. So whenever you actually processed in your own mind, not talking about the stories or anything, but your own personal experience, when you actually come to the conclusion that dog men are real, that changed the way you do things. I mean, what do you think? What do you think about Bigfoot, dog man, what do you think that they are? What do you think that they're doing? What do you think that they want? How has that influenced your um, writing and everything? I mean, go into all of that, especially on the dog man side, if you would. Okay. I, I, I'm a voracious reader. You can ask my wife. I've got a huge book collection. I'm constantly reading books, uh, especially on this subject, but you know, on other subjects as well. Um, but there is a fantastic book you should check out called Them and Us by Danny yeah. Vendramini. I've seen it. Dan, yeah. yeah, Danny postulates that the, what we were taught in school was a Neanderthal really wasn't. That is correct. That, that the Neanderthal looked a lot more like a modern Bigfoot. And I think that that's a very good possible explanation. And and the scientific the scientific evidence that he brings to back that up mm -hmm. is 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 really uh, profound. Yeah, if you and haven't it, read that book, I recommend getting a copy. Yes, absolutely, it is worth reading. And the the images that he has of what they believe Neanderthal actually looked like. If you don't look at that and think Bigfoot, then yeah, you you're you're yeah. No, not to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but y'all, oh, for everybody that watches this show, if you will just do a Google search and look at the images, but do a Google search of them and us, you will see the picture that he put forward of what they think a Neanderthal looked like at that point. And if you just scroll down a little bit, you will see a couple a couple images where people have changed uh, the pupils and the nose a little bit. Pumbo has even suggested that. Yep, you know uh, what I'm saying, Greg. That's one of Kumbo's go-to's. He says that 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 looks more like the boogers than anything else. Just a little bit of tweaking on the nose, as he said, it will be spot on. And I can explain the little bit of tweaking as well. I can explain that easily. Regional variances. Look at the black bear. Yes. A black bear from the East Coast is very different from a West Coast black bear. They're the yes. same species. They can interbreed, but you can tell them apart just at a glance. Regional variances would account for subtle differences in their faces. And whenever he goes on to explain about how 
the Neanderthal possibly almost wiped out Homo sapiens uh, because of predatory things, you, you know, essentially eating people, you know. I mean, it just really makes you think this sounds a lot like Native American descriptions of boogers and their interactions with them. But it, also explains, it also explains the Uncanny Valley theory. The Uncanny Valley theory is it was a, was done by psychologists. It was a research, a research topic. They interviewed people from all over the world, from all walks of life, from different backgrounds, different continents. And they came to the conclusion that humans, no matter where they're from, have an innate fear of something that looks almost like us, especially in the dark. So go into the dog man thing. Well, much like Bigfoot, you know, prior to the 1980s, there was no name of dog man. Dog man didn't exist. Right. But prior to 1957, the word Bigfoot didn't exist. Locals called them wild men or boogers or Shigetonka in the case of the Lakota or, you know, Sasquatch or, you know, any one of the thousand names, the Alma, the Almasti, Yero, Yero, and there are a million names for these creatures that all existed prior to the word Bigfoot. Same thing happens with Dogman. There's a creature that, that both the Roman Empire and Alexander the Great documented encountering called the Sinocephali. They are yep. described as fierce, dog-headed warriors that would eat the flesh of the fallen. Rome documented fighting him in North Africa. Alexander the Great documented fighting him in India. These are documented in their journals. Marco Polo, Christopher Columbus, both documented encountering Sinocephali during their travels. The, the Christian saint, St. Christopher, is known as the dog-headed saint. In Catholic iconography, he is pictured with the head of a dog. It's said that until he performed his first miracle, he was he was cursed to look like this dog creature. Then you've got the legend of the werewolf. You've got uh, the Cherokee legend of the Ulonga dog Lala, the spirit with knife teeth. They, they like describe creatures very much like a dog man. Just because we didn't have a word dog man doesn't mean they didn't exist before. These things have been here for a very long time. They're just hard to find. And I think the reason they are is if you look at the map of the missing 411 where all the clusters are, where the major clusters of disappearances are, and then overlay that next to a map of the major cave systems in the U.S., they're identical. Yeah. They match the perfectly. Yeah, a lot, yes. Did you did you ever see did you ever see the supposed documentation of that Roman general uh, talking about the Insino Syphili whenever they went out to fight him and after a couple weeks he was like my troops are diminishing by this and I don't think we will withstand the night. Yeah, I remember I remember reading that. Yeah, that's the, pretty the, terrifying. It really is, and I tell you what. I tried fact checking that and seeing if there was anything to that. And that Roman general supposedly existed and their their troop movement was in that area of uh Germania, mm -hmm. I think it was, w whenever that happened. Man, there's still sightings of of dogman and bigfoot like creatures in the Black Forest, the Schwarzwald of Germany. That is a, still an area where people go missing. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Norse, the, we're the Norse were afraid, afraid of the mist. Down. Nor the the Vikings, who were known to be fierce warriors, though they talked about the elf headnar, the, the wolf headed warriors. That's right. Um, yes. Yep. The the Vikings were afraid of creatures that took them in the mist. Uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of people don't know it about Bigfoot, but Leif Erikson coming well, to I'm, this country. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Documented dealing with these large hairy wild men that were they to as the big scralings. As... Do what? They called them the scralings because of what the screeching noise they would make. Oh. Did not know that. Hey, well, is that Spencer, can you even have you even tried to watch the movie that was supposed to be like filmed in Europe, the the dog soldiers where the werewolves come out? I watched it. I watched it. How, how big did, did you like have nightmares for three weeks after you watched that? No, movie? no, 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 no. I will say this. The the scariest werewolf movie I've ever seen 
if I had to pick between all of them, I don't know about scary, but the best werewolf movies I've ever seen. I would say number one is an American werewolf in London. Great movie. Uh, if, if you're talking about just straight lycanthropy, like, like, like someone actually being a werewolf and turning into a werewolf. And then I would say, uh, I would say bad moon is a really, really great movie. It's right up there with it. And the howling though, whenever I was younger, whenever I was like 12, 13, I saw the howling and I still have nightmares about the howling. About Stephen King's silver bullet. I love that. I love that movie, but that movie didn't, it scared me a little bit because when I, was the a kid, I used to love that movie. Oh, yeah. Have you guys have you guys seen the movie? Howl. Howl. Seen one? what? Have you yes. seen the movie Howl? It's yeah. set on a on a train in England. That yes. movie yes. is terrifying. Did yeah. you see yes. what, Great movie. what is the movie with the guy over in Italy or France? And uh the cops want him for a murder. And he ends up being a werewolf to some degree. Like, like he only transforms to a certain degree. He he gets bigger, he gets hairier, he gets nastier, all that kind of stuff. That that was a good movie psychologically. How <laughs> the movie about the train? I'll I'll send it to you. I'll find it, DA. Yeah. I check out that comment. The uh, not well. We'll talk about the Lion Men of Judah. Yeah, but. But check out Scott Scott M's comment. How cool would that be? Says his buddy owns the wheelchair. Sure. Oh, that would be freaking cool. How cool would that be? Seriously? I, I used to, I, when I first hurt my back and it looked like I was going to wind up in a chair, I was joking with my wife saying I'm going to build the chair from silver bullet so I can stick <laughs> it up in the woods. But guys, look, here, here I'm going to jump back on my point and I'm going to beat this dead horse a little bit further. All these movies that we're bragging on, the ones that we're saying are great. If you take yes. and you take DA stuff, his wild bunch or his wild hunt guys, y'all blown out of the water. The the plot. Thank you, man. Thank you. It it wouldn't hold a candle. Y'all, Stephen King stuff. Garbage, garbage. It's garbage. <laughs> Thank you, man. That's huge praise. Dude, I all day building my rabbit hutch. When you sent me those, I just put them on just yes. the auto. Just set and right. to all could, could, in the your mind, could you not see these guys? I could see. I could see. <laughs> I could see the the creatures. I could see all the the people in it. I was right. watching. I, when I listen to it, I see a movie. In it, Greg. Just so everybody knows, Greg is the one that got Da on the show today and greg sent us links to da stuff and said watch this watch this watch this misty's been building a rabbit hut for four days for some reason because it takes a long damn time and i i have not watched the stuff that greg sent us unless it's one of the ones that i've already seen before but yes greg greg brags about you non-stop da just so you know thank you brother appreciate it Dude, look, I, I'm going to tell you, man, you know, I've been trying to get when I, I've been a lot busy, but I've been jumping in watching your, y'all's, uh, y'all's podcast, been in the Thank live yet, and that's what I told them the other day, I said, I was so let down, because we got, we got a lot of folks who, for us, you know, jump in our live chat, and the other day, it was only two people that's usually in our live chat was in, in y'all's, and I'm like, where's all our people at? Well, they, I've got to. I got to let these folks know they're missing out. Y'all got to get over here and watch Da and them. And but it was it was Joe Parker and River Morris. Well, at least they had River and Joe. Oh really? I've, I've, seen, I've seen some familiar names in your chat that people that are oh on my God. chat fairly regularly. Uh, yeah. Da Da, you should talk to River Morris. River is pure one hundred percent Aboriginal from Australia. He's had a ton of experience, and he can tell you even more. Story. I'd, I'd love to hear. Oh, it, hey, now, that would be now, now, Joe Parker, you need to just avoid Joe. You need to, <laughs> you need to just avoid Parker. Oh, I'm just kidding, Joe. Don't light me up in the comments. I will say this for everybody that's watching right now: about a hundred people. Da has a show, and they go live, and they have chats and everything. 
you should jump in over there, support the people that we support and everybody, you know, we're a community y'all. Absolutely. Check out, check out DA stuff. Yeah. We're we're live twice a week on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 PM central. Oh, you got the good times. It blows my mind, dude, how, how one guy comes up with like Will Gregel and, and all the, all the people in it. It's just, man, it is phenomenal. Well, to me, the best stories that I've ever read or you know experienced watching a movie, the best stories are featured around characters that are solid. You've got to have solid characters. If the characters can't carry the story, no amount of plot is going to carry the story. You've got to have people that not only your, your readers can relate to, but have got to got to got to like and respect. Because you know, if, if if none of your characters are likable, people aren't gonna aren't gonna want to read it or, or watch it. Yeah. Now I do have some characters that are that are assholes. I mean, I you know I'm not gonna, not gonna not gonna make excuses for some of them, but they're they're mixed in amongst other characters that are in a lot of a lot of respects based on personality traits or even straight up based on people that that. I've worked with and known for years. Um, I, then, everything I ever did as a cop or in the military or in life, every every experience I've ever had, I draw on to try to make the the experiences in the book as believable and as realistic possible. Um, like the like Greg, when you watch a movie and somebody pulls out a, a Glock and you hear the sound effect of them cocking a hammer, does that drive you crazy? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Dude. Something like that doesn't happen in my books because. <laughs> Or it's empty. What kills me? They, they fire it. The slide locks back, and there's it's still throwing in the snap, snap, snap. Yeah, Wait, there's no. What kills, no, what kills uh, me is they have to slide it back like it's not already chambered. Right. Yeah. Like, why are you not carrying one in the chamber? Good God. Yes. Yes. So, so essentially, what Da is saying is that all three of us are going to be referenced in his books from now on. We're gonna be like. <laughs> Characters, because he's like, "Hey, I base it off real life assholes that I know." Hey, don't, no, don't be surprised. We put me in there as the weird bunch instead of the wild bunch. You know, one of the <laughs> yeah. one of the things that uh, that I've always always believed as a writer is that you know, there's a thing what, what we refer to as suspension of disbelief. It's you know, when you're writing a story, it could be about Bigfoot, it could be about zombies, it could be set in space, but people will you know, suspend that disbelief and go along with the story if the foundation of details is solid. Your your, yeah. your your big story has to rest on a foundation of solid, good stories and, and good, you know, good details. Uh, so that's that's why things like um, like, you know, you know, the, the safety, you know, somebody said I thumbed off the safety on my Glock. Glock doesn't have safety. It's on the that's trigger. Right. I've got to make sure the details are right. And it looks like something crazy is going on when I write a combat scene because I'll have four or five pieces of paper written uh, sitting on my desk in front of me and I'll have different people's names written down that are going to be involved in it might be you know person x or it might be Daniel Clark or Will Gray Eagle I'll have their names written down and every time they expend around like if I say they fired three times I put little check marks next to their name put little tick marks like you you know like three four then five that kind of thing to keep track of the number of rounds they fired, so I know they're changing their magazines when they're starting. There you go. Yes, I, I literally do that when I'm when Gotta I'm writing combat. Things. That's just like, look, y'all got to listen to his the uh, the Bigfoot Afghanistan deal. Y'all got to listen. To that. My gosh, the da da. Do you get to the point where it's like if it's thirty round mag, you only load twenty eight, and you're mentally counting while you do it and you drop it and swap it before you're completely clicking blank. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I watch those details because, you know, you remember the old, uh, was it Beverly Hills cop where he fired like 40 some rounds out of a, yes. out of a Beretta yes. without ever changing the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Details like that will lose your audience. That's how yeah. you lose your suspension of di- disbelief. People will accept, just- people will accept that the, these guys are in combat against a group of dog men as long as you're not saying, you know, he bounced a bullet off a tree and shot it in the back of the head, you know, you've got to have your details believable. And that's why uh, not only do I count my rounds, I use real products. 
uh, like I'll tell you, I'll say it's a Noveski chambered in 556, uh, Scallywag Tactical Blades. Um, they're one of my affiliates on my channel. They sponsor my channel because I feature all of their blades in my books. I mean, Scallywag makes some amazing knives. So I featured it. Daniel, Daniel Clark carries Scallywag blades. And I will talk about the specific blade they carry. And I've got a bunch of their knives. They're fantastic knives. But I use real world tech. Uh, you know, if I if I if I do something off the off the reservation, so to speak, it's it's based in reality. Like when I uh, in the first Wild Hunt book, when they start talking about the mimic units, um, basically they're just oversized Connex boxes that lock together to form a mobile mobile base. When I first put that book out, I uh, I just I came up with that idea. I looked at real technology what we were able to do and said, well, if we can do this, I bet we can do this. And about a week after that book released, a buddy of mine that is still in the special forces community called me. He's like, Hey, um, let me ask you something. I'm like, yeah. He's like, where are you getting your Intel? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, how did you know about those? I'm like, what <laughs> the units? He's like, well, that's not what we call them. But the description is dead on. He said, "Where did you hear about those?" I said, "Well, I just kind of, I just kind of read October that shit." And like like Tom Clancy just looked at what they what they were willing to admit a sub could do and said, "Well, if they say it'll do this, I bet it'll do this." That's just kind of kind of what I did. I just looked at real technology, what we've done, and took a guess for the next generation. He goes, "Well, we've been using those things for years." He says, and furthermore, he said, "Let me ask you something else." I'm like, "What's that?" He goes, "Where did you hear about?" a team like Wild Hunt. I said, again, I've talked to so many people that have, that have cited incidents where special forces units showed up at a, at a major sighting or an attack, pushed people out of the area and took it over. So I just said, I bet there's probably a team out there that the government fields for these events for dangerous cryptids. And he goes, well, you're a little closer to the mark than you really want to know. Wow. Really? He said, you made a few people nervous. When you when you put that book out, I wish you'd have talked about me about it with me first. I said, well, Wait. Cool, that's out of the bag. <laughs> Wait, no, no, no. You got to go into detail. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, hey, let me ask you this then. In just your personal opinion, you ain't got a you ain't got to say that somebody told you it. Mm -hmm. In just your personal opinion, you think the government knows about cryptids and the reality of them? I believe the that government has known about cryptids for a long time. And I'll, 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 I'll let me uh, let me uh, make sure my tin foil hats in, in, in place. Uh, if you guys if you guys will run down a rabbit hole with me for a minute, I'm going to tell you why I believe the government has known about these things for a long time. One of the earliest known encounter stories that we have of a Bigfoot killing a person was documented by Teddy Roosevelt in his book The Wilderness. Oh, it's, it's called the Bauman Incident. Okay, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt. Wrote that, book, wrote that book prior to go holding political office, okay? Not only was Bauman killed there, but a year before, another trapper had been killed in that same valley. And the natives That's were saying, stay out of that valley. There's, a da right. there's dangerous creatures up there. And Bauman and his partner didn't, didn't, didn't listen. They went up there. The partner was killed. Bauman abandoned everything, which was a lot of money that he left behind, yeah. and ran. Bauman's first name is never given. Bauman never came forward, not even at a, you know, like somebody sitting around having a few too many drinks at a campfire. Bauman never came forward. Teddy Roosevelt was on the on the skull team, and when he went to when he went to the Ivy League, oh, he went to Harvard. He was on the skull team, which is the little narrow ass boat. You know what the front position on a skull team is called? A Bauman. Bauman, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt was Bauman. I guarantee it. He had political aspirations. He didn't want to come forward and admit that his partner had been killed. One, you know, there might have been some culpability issues where he might have been blamed for the death, but he also didn't want to say, I saw this, this monster, and people think he's crazy because he had political aspirations. Teddy Roosevelt knew about Bigfoot. So flash forward, President Teddy Roosevelt, what's one of the first things he does? He sets aside the National Park Service. Ooh, the National 88 Park. million yeah. acres. Yes, sir. 88 mil no, not acres. 88 million square miles. I did not think about that. Yes. And 
There's a secret society in Arkansas. It's actually worldwide, but it's headquarters in Arkansas that's based around the Ozarks Howler. It's called the Concatenated Order of the Hoo-Hoo. I know it's a stupid sounding name, but that's what it is. It's a secret society and it still exists. It is by invitation only, and you have to be a you have to work and be employed in some form in, with, with, with the timber industry. That's the only way you can can get uh, involved with this, this this secret society. It still exists. Teddy Roosevelt was the president of it, and it is it is believed that Teddy Roosevelt set aside the Ozark National Forest, which is almost two million square acres, just for the Ozark Howler. Roosevelt knew about Mark Cryptids and was a believer. Look, y'all. No. <laughs> hey, no. I, when he was talking about a sacred organization in Arkansas, I saw that going down a Clinton. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, uh, Kumbo has talked about that. Hold yeah. on. Stop. 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 The show. Teddy Roosevelt and I believe it was Woodrow Wilson, two U.S. presidents, have been the president of that order. Wow. At different yep. times in their lives. No, because we're going to get into uh, we're going to get into secret societies and all this kind of stuff. Y'all, yeah, we go down a rabbit hole. We go. We we, oh, we back hold, on, answer. hold on. Yeah. Hey, hey, we, oh. <laughs> first of all, first of all, I have questions for Da that I got to ask backstage. <laughs> and number two, we got to get him back on. Da, would you come back on again at some sure. point? Love to. We got to get DA back on and go over some of this stuff. But y'all, DA is dropping bombs right now. That are if you will go if you will go back and look at what he's talking about about Bowman Bowman Bowman, however you say. It. Teddy Roosevelt. I'm not even going to get into all that. Look at. Look at Daniel Boone. Look at Jim Bowie. Look at Davy Crockett. Look at uh, a lot of this stuff, especially Teddy Roosevelt. But Da, <laughs> you're taking the show in a whole different direction right here. Sorry. I try to all the time, and Spencer just he, he shuts me down. He he won't let me talk about it, so I'm loving it. <laughs> oh, you are so full of crap. Do you have more fun riding? Riding like this, or when somebody's whooping the wheel. Hey, look here. When you're yeah. fishtailing down a gravel road. Yes, sir. Hey, hey, That's me. State law. State law. hey, DA, real quick, what do you think about aliens? Uh, well, you know, it's funny that the government is now admitting they're there. I've I've long believed we were there, they were there. I mean, saying that there's no intelligent life in the universe is like walking up to the ocean with a teaspoon and picking up a, a teaspoonful of water and go, yeah, no sharks. They don't exist. <laughs> right, right. We are yeah. one tiny planet in one solar system of one galaxy uh, that is, a, that is a, a network of other galaxies that is part of a cluster that is part of a super cluster that is part of a mega cluster out of thousands of mega clusters, how how is it? Only life is only on this planet. I agree. It's ego. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, we don't uh, want to believe there's anything smarter than us out there, but there are. Look, y'all, hold on. Here we go. We need an all nighter with this part, please. Yes. The rabbit hole goes deeper. Hey, right. this is yes. Like, this is but. Like, this is why we need DA to show up at the meet and greet, so we can just sit around the campfire. That'd yes, be I'd love it. Hey, DA. Hey, by the way, about the meet and greet, y'all. We are we're at maximum capacity. If people want to come and show up during the day, but not necessarily camp there, you are still welcome to go on the Woodwalkers Facebook page. Go to the meet and greet Facebook page and click the thing up at the very top that says going. And if you click that, we know that you're going and everything so we can account for everybody. Uh, Roosevelt was a trapper, a big game hunter. Most definitely. This is a story with a very thin premise. Evidence, please just not conjecture there's Hold tons on. there's tons of information on on 
Teddy Roosevelt hunting pretty much everything that could be hunted. Oh my gosh. And yeah. He was, was, was an outdoorsman. It, it, he traveled it, all over the West. It, uh, yeah, there's plenty of more than anecdotal evidence of it, him of him trapping. In fact, in fact, the bombing story was part of like a series of books that he put out. It, it, it was one part. And a lot of it was dealing with trappers and his experiences with trapping, hunting, camping, uh, exploring caverns and all that kind of stuff. And there's just like literally a shit ton of people that testified to that stuff in the books. You, you know, as a child, Teddy Roosevelt was actually a sickly child. Yes. He had, he had asthma and, and several other childhood diseases that, that kept him from going outside. And when he, I think he reached like 13 or 14, he's just decided that one day I'm not going to let this crap beat me. And he started pushing himself farther and farther every day. And then finally, you know, he turned into be the robust fella he was. He was actually shot on the way to deliver a, 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 a speech. And the bullet went through his speech and penetrated into his chest like three quarters of an inch or something like that. The dude still went to the 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 the, uh, the, the speech and gave the speech before he went to the hospital. Yep. So you look up badass in the dictionary, you're going to picture Teddy Roosevelt grinning back at you. Uh, yeah, carry, hey, a, carry a big stick. Guess what, Spencer? What I may know, I may know exactly in my gun safe where there is a Winchester Model 94 3030. Oh. It's a <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt commemorative. I bet you a medallion in the stock and it's inlaid with gold, unfired from like 1967. Wow. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I'm, it, a, it, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt fan, brother. If, yeah. if anybody I knew would have had one of those, what? Huh? Well, the Rossi that you're going to sell me for four hundred dollars, <laughs> I will. I will just add a thousand. You can give me that one. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> all right, y'all, listen, hold on, because the area that DA is going down. If you're going to go down the rabbit hole, you got to go down the rabbit hole for a while. All the way, right? Everybody agrees with that. So it's going to take a few hours to do that. That's why I say, hold on. Before we go further in this direction, let's set up a whole different show where we can actually go into it. You guys want to talk about dogmen more? You want to talk about Roosevelt more? You want to talk about the alien Bigfoot dogman angel connection thing? Whatever. We'll do a whole separate show on it. But we're, uh, you, we're actually this coming Saturday. Uh, we we're going to be doing the deep dive on the, on the what this coming this coming Saturday. We're going to be doing a deep dive on the on the uh, the Roosevelt story <laughs> on our show. That's that's oh, our really? topic. We're, we're awesome. that's our whole topic. We're going to be talking about Roosevelt and cryptids. Awesome. Uh, there you go. The link to all of his channels are in the description. Misty has been flashing them at the bottom. Yeah, and everything. We will get him back on though, and have a Woodwalkers version of go through all this crap, DA, and oh, yeah. explain 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 what we're looking at here. Yeah. We'll have to get and you all on our show one of these nights too. Bye. Hey, if you, we'll be if there. You, if you want to, uh, y'all. I, I think our our our, our uh, I think our audience would enjoy it too. Well, we're. We're a little bit lively compared to the average YouTube show, but if you're willing to do it, we'll do it. No way. That's my buddy Kerry says. I'm down like four flat tires. That's there right. you go. There Look, you go. We, us three right here, uh, we've done decided if it's something that's really like like a funeral or in church, we can't sit yeah. next to each other. You know, we no. Yeah, I, I believe me. I, I yeah, I'm, I'm I'm the guy that you know has to be introduced to new people with a proviso, like okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Yes. He might say something that that might freak you out, so you know, just be warned. Greg Greg says that between the three of us, our personalities, we make a whole person. Hey, we make a well-rounded person. Yes, we do. I think. Hey, uh, Da. Do you have anything else like on the Bigfoot subject you want to add, like for this show? Um, you know, I think we I think we've we've pretty well covered covered stuff. But you know, if if 
if you've got an encounter, let these guys know. If you will reach out to us at DA Roberts at daroberts.net, because uh, these things are out there. And when when you look at places like the BFRO or or the GCBRO or any of these push <coughs> these, these uh, organizations that document sightings, you're only seeing a percentage and probably a small percentage of the actual encounters that are happening out there. That is encounters correct. are happening in every day that people don't come forward about. Stories that might blow your mind, and it might be somebody you would least expect your own in your own family or your own your, your own spouse. Uh, my wife was kind of on the fence about Bigfoot. She really was, despite all the stuff I've done, going out in the woods. She was just like, you know what? I've never seen anything that really made me made me think it's just you know you guys aren't just imagining things that kind of crap. And and I love my wife. She's a farm girl, but she didn't really go out and do the woods stuff with me. Uh, you know, she'll, she'll go if it's like, you know, at a park or something, but she's not going to go traipsing into the woods with me. So this last July uh, was our 30th anniversary. And we decided we were going to go spend a week at a cabin in the, the uh, Smoky Mountains, just outside Gatlinburg. And we got a cabin up in the mountains. Uh, there were other cabins around, but they weren't close. You know, you couldn't even see them through the trees. So, you know, we, it's not like we were the only cabin on the mountain, but we were pretty remote. And uh, come Wednesday night, I'm laying in bed, kind of reading. And uh, the, the cabin was split level. The bedroom was downstairs with a, with a deck, and then the living room was upstairs with a deck. And uh, we'd, we'd heard stuff like walk around the cabin at night. We just assumed it was bears. There's a ton of bears up in the Smokies. In fact, we even had one on our deck for a while. It came up and was licking the grease out of the, the grease trap on the barbecue grill. Uh, so we, 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 were, you know, we were perfectly content knowing there were bears around us. It didn't bother us a bit. But on Wednesday night, we stayed there for a week. Right there in the middle of the week, she's, she goes to the bathroom and she goes, huh? I'm like, what? She goes, did you hear that? I'm like, no, I didn't hear anything. What, what do you hear? She goes, something outside the bathroom window kind of grunted. I said, that's probably a bear. She goes, no, it was. It sounded close, and, and the, that side of the house was like on a, on the mountainside. It was like about a forty-five degree angle. So anything standing out there is, it, it's going to take it a minute. You know, it's it's not on level ground. Mm -hmm. Um, so she said, I heard this thing grunt two or three times, and uh, good night, Mike, Michael. And uh, she said, I heard it grunt two or three times. I said, well, it's just probably a bear. So she comes back to bed. I turn off the light. I roll over and I'm dozing off and all of a sudden, wham, wham, no wham, way. three times on the wall of that bathroom out the outside yeah. of the cabin. She's like, what the hell was that? So I jumped up, grabbed a, my pistola and a flashlight and I run upstairs so I can look down through the windows and there's nothing out there. Security, I've got the security lights on, you know, I flipped on all the security lights up around the cabin. There's, I don't see anything. So I don't think too much of it. I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe it was a bear. Maybe it was a tree branch because the wind was blowing a little bit. So I convinced myself everything's fine. I go back to bed. The next morning I get up to watch the sunrise come up, come on over the Rockies. I, get, I like to go out on the deck with, my, with a cup of coffee early in the morning. So I go out there. She's sitting in, in the living room drink, sipping a cup of coffee. I'm out on the deck in just running shorts and a T-shirt with a cup of coffee. And I go over to the edge of the deck on that side of the house, and I looked down, and I went, surely not. And I'm like, honey, come here. She's like, what? I'm like, come here. And she said, well, she, had, she thought it was, had, I, I'd seen a bear. So she comes walking out on the deck over to that side, and I grab a branch and push it back so she can lean out and look. And setting just outside that bathroom window is a track. Perfect right in that dirt. And it's like I said, it's a 45 degree angle. It's rocky soil. So I take pictures with my cell phone and then I grab my DSLR and go out the back so I can shimmy down that hill and get better pictures. Um, we estimate the track was about 21 inches long. Wow. It was about, a, about an inch and a half into rocky soil. And it was literally just outside that, that bathroom wall where we heard the thumps. She sees it. I got pictures of it. I can send you guys pictures of it. I want to cast it, but I didn't bring any casting materials. I went up there to write. So I'm like, I tell my wife, I said, I'm going to get dressed and run into Walmart because there's a Walmart about 10 miles away. I'm going to run to Walmart 
get some plaster pairs and come back and cast that. So I go back in the house, finish my coffee and start getting dressed. And it started raining oh. and it came down hard and it rained for like the better part of the rest of the day. So that track was absolutely ruined, but I've got probably 60 really good images of it. Some of them where you can see the depth of it. I've got a, one of my business cards in the image for scale. It's easily four times the length of that business card. And yeah, it's it's a beautiful track. It was probably the best track I've ever found. You could see the toes. You could see the heel. It was The definition was fantastic. And I just wish to God I could have cast it. I mean, I found tons of prints over the years just, that weren't cheap. I found plenty of partials. But that to find an absolute, just like beautiful track that was perfect to cast, although I still haven't figured out how we would have cast it on a 45-degree angle. That would have been a bit tough. Just one? Just one? Just well, there were other partials where it had like like uh, skated on that on the loose soil climbing that hill, that hill, but there was one perfect one. But there were other tracks around it that were where it had scuffed in the dirt and where there were partial uh, partial prints, but that one was perfect. And oh my god, yeah. I wish I could have cast it. I really do. Here we, here we go. One last one last Bigfoot question before we hop off here. What do you think boogers are? Da, what do you think Bigfoot is? You know, I, I don't really think there's one definitive answer to that. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I very much agree with Danny Vendramini's assessment that some of them could be relic, relic Neanderthal, but some, but some of the descriptions, like the way people describe Gugway, it just doesn't doesn't fit. So I think there's more than one type. Um, and, and I think it, it accounts for more than just regional variances. Um, so I, I don't know that I can give you a definitive answer. I don't know that I can say this is what it is. But I think at least some of them are probably relic, relic populations of, of uh, Neanderthal or Denisovians. House, you got anything else? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I'm just... I'm just this has been an awesome show. Today. We're like, gonna we're gonna do a part two. We got to. We yeah, got I'm to. Down. Yes. I'm down. That, we, I, I don't know if we can squeeze it into this one more episode. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to come back anytime y'all want. Like I said, I'm retired now, so I yeah, pretty you. much make my own schedule. Yeah. Thank you, Squirrel. What you got? No, I, I've enjoyed it. I'm telling you, right. <laughs> you've been She's a great guest. I've watched you on some, some of your podcasts with the lives, like the one that um, not too long ago, me and Roger actually was watching the one where you had Dark Waters on. And that was a good was, episode. I love Dark Waters. That great was, yes, that was great. Uh, uh, hey, DA, if you start talking about like spooks and ghosts and spirits and everything, you will get Squirrel's attention, and she'll have 10,000 questions for you. Well, um, I can tell you some of the times that that we encountered paranormal crap when I was a cop. It has happened. Rick, yeah. When you were a cop? Oh, hold on. Hold on. Episode, episode I, I, could go, I could go another couple hours just on the weird shit that's happened when I was a cop. Episode oh, three. This is episode hey. one. We'll do episode two, and now there's episode three. Go. I promise right Me? now, if Misty didn't have her glasses on, y'all could have just saw her eyes dilate. Yes. <laughs> make, make sure to remind me to tell you the story. I spent two hours chasing shadow figures. Shut wow. up. Spent two <laughs> hours chasing them. Wow. Wait, like in the woods? No. On the sixth floor of Cox South Hospital all in Springfield, right, Missouri. Right. Hold on, hold on. That's episode three. Hold on, hold on. Don't yeah. give it all away. You got to, you got to tease a little bit. Put out a little leg. You got to, you got to hold back on some of the stuff. I, uh, I, I've got some really creepy stories. A lot of them around the hospital, but some of them while on patrol. And you know, I'm a firm, firm believer in the paranormal. I mean. You know, my mother grew up in a haunted house. You know, it's just this kind of weird stuff seems to follow my family. But um, yeah, I've got quite a few paranormal stories from when I was in uniform. Oh my gosh, we're gonna go into the whole thing of are you marked? Are you? Whenever you see them, do they see you? Do they? I've had. I've been physically touched, 
And one night while looking for what we thought was an intruder, I had something grab my radio strap. Because, you know, uh, Greg, how you run your radio from your belt up your back and then click yeah. it to your lapel? I had something grab my radio strap, pull it, and flip it. And I spun around, and there was nothing there. Oh, wow. Now, wow. Stop. I've been poked in the spots. had my hair pulled. <laughs> That's episode three. What Squirrel's talking about is episode four. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> all right hold on oh i have to say a uh very sincere vic cundiff called gave us some like inside tips and everything thank you vic greatly yeah, appreciate you. it uh, vic, vic's gotta know we all love Vic, especially coming from somebody like that greatly appreciate it sorry i know we let you down on this show, but or not you, but just whatever YouTube, the community standards, whatever we will try to do better. Anyway, for the hundred people that actually watch this live, what I said, I don't care. I had fun. I started to say, I don't, I don't give a sh that I didn't. <laughs> see, see, we're on a struggle bus. We're trying. We're trying. Well, we do the same thing. We'll go off on tangents or somebody will drop an F-bomb. And <laughs> Yes. Yes. I, I, most I, of us aren't fit for polite company. Hey, no matter how this turns out, keep this in mind. If you ever saw very real people talking about like boogers and just being friends and being just real and down to earth, that's that's what we're doing and now we're trying to watch some of the stuff that we do maybe to a degree a little bit or whatever yeah hey let me let me throw out one more thing yes we we talked about this before before we came on guys we got some people that apparently that watch us a lot it's we like 30 percent we got we got a bunch of them that's uh that's not subscribed Y'all, that subscribe button, and we got talking about, I don't know why, but I mean, they y'all keep coming back. That subscribe button, I think a lot of people think that you're going to get a bill or it's going to be added on to your, like your internet or something. Guys, you're you not going to pay uh, for it. Yo, know, it, it's absolutely free. You'll not get a bill. We're not making any money. But It was, the it was like 33% or something like that of people that watch us regularly, you know, yeah. aren't subscribed, yeah, yeah. so I don't know if you all were. Yeah, yeah we we're, we're, not getting any money. we're not asking for money, but it helps us get, get out because the more subscribers, the more our show is going to reach out to other people. And, you know, we just appreciate it. Just hit that little subscribe button and you'll be subscribed. And then when we're having a show, you'll get a notification. So, well, it's not like we're trying to take over the internet or be uber famous or anything like that. We would just like to present to everybody in the cryptic Bigfoot field, anything like that. We would like to try to present our view and get people on that we think are legitimate, have real experiences, all that kind of stuff. If you hit subscribe, it helps the damn algorithm get the stuff out and everything and get it to everybody else. If you comment, apparently... That helps too. I don't know all this kind of stuff. I don't take it that serious. Again, Vic, love you. Thank you. We will try to do better. Anyway, <laughs> please, people, everybody that watched this, if nothing else, give a thumbs up for DA and go check yeah. out DA's channel. Younger and all the links are in there. Go check out Vic Cundiff. And also, uh, Hey, Dogman Encounters is always great, but sometimes I don't like listening to it because it's about <laughs> dogs. But on my Sasquatch sighting, ain't that what it's called? My Sasquatch something on Vic's channel? I think it's my Sasquatch sighting. My Sasquatch experience. Is anybody in there in the chat? No, no. My Sasquatch something. My Sasquatch sighting or whatever. Anyway. His most recent one that just came out like a day and my Bigfoot sighting. Thank you, Christy. Uh, there. Y'all, 
that's a channel on YouTube. It's one of Vic's channels. Go look at the most recent one. Because that guy talking about growing up around them and living with them, if that dude is lying, he's really, really good at lying. Just go watch that episode. And subscribe to Vic's channel. Subscribe to DA. All that kind of stuff. You know everybody else, Roger, all that kind of stuff, Mark and Larry. Eventually, we'll get something that scrolls up here and says, hey, we support all these people. It's too much to remember. Yeah. I, once again, guys, I, I'm just honored. I feel honored, and I'm, you know, that anybody wants to come see what we're doing. But I appreciate and love every one of y'all. Appreciate you so much. See a lot of y'all at the meet and greet. DA, thank you very much. Thank hang you. out back, hang out backstage for yes, just one minute. We want to talk awesome. to you. Yeah. If anybody wants to write us or email us and tell us about what happened to you or you want to be on the show or something, let us know. Thank you. All right. Y'all have a good night. Bye. Bye, you all. Squirrel. <laughs> hey, y'all. Hey, Spencer. We're swapped Hello. around again. Huh? We're swapped around again. Yep, I know you do it on purpose.